Dire Wave 3. Welcome to another live stream, late afternoon live stream. Hope everybody's doing good. Hope you had a good weekend. We had an insane weekend. We had the chance to drive up to go to church at the same time as basically the craziest tornado of all time. Um, went across five states and so appreciate everybody reaching out yes we were fine um, I was in Nashville at the time uh, and everything was okay there was I never heard all the sirens going off <clears throat> and I had seen that towns were being completely demolished so uh, we went ahead when we were in Nashville went to the basement so <laughs> I knew that it, this was a serious enough tornado situation that we would uh, definitely have to take cover i've been in one other real tornado so it's pretty crazy a lot of people who don't live in an area of the world or in an area of the u.s that gets tornadoes they don't realize that they can be pretty wild i mean they can completely just remove the house from its foundations you know depending on what kind of a level of tornado it is so it just so happened that the other night it was an f5 which is you know, Helen Hunt, Bill Paxton level, you know, twister <laughs> stuff. So we're dead meat, man. We're going to be fry bologna, man. We're going to be put in nature's blender, man. Oh, man. Anyway, that's Bill Paxton from Aliens doing his fear-based exposition of what happens when the F5, I think, isn't T Twister is a terrible movie, by the way, but isn't it like a, something crazy in disaster movies? Always have to ramp it up. So I think in Twister, it's like a don't they make up something fake like a F seven or a F nine or something like that? But they had said that the one that happened the other night, it was like um, well, there was like twenty different tornadoes, but at one point it was they said a mile wide. I don't know if they mean the cell in the clouds is a mile wide or what's on the ground i saw a lot of different pictures so it's hard to tell but <clears throat> there can be gigantic you know on the ground cells if you remember the one that happened in what was it alabama or arkansas like 10 years ago and then in 2015 or 14 or 15 there was the joplin one and those were uh well they don't still don't know how many people were pa have passed away from the one the other night so it could be more than the joplin one who knows um they think at least 70 to 100 already but i mean towns not far from us don't even exist anymore like literally just gone the whole town's gone i've never seen anything like that 
because usually when a tornado hits, it's very precise. Like it'll hit like one, like one guy's house will be gone and the house next to it is fine. It's, it's, it's crazy like that. And this was like a giant tornado that just like did a line up several states. Uh, like one giant tornado made of 20 tornadoes. So like Voltron of tornadoes, basically. Uh, so, and being in Tennessee, you know, I've seen tornadoes my whole life. Uh, been only in one that passed over the house I was in and destroyed some stuff downtown. So if you're in one, you know what it's like, you know, to hear the sounds and it sounds like a choo-choo train. <laughs> Cause the wind's going so fast. Right. So anyway, um, I think on, if you go to my Twitter, by the way, I did share a link. I think most of those are reputable. I always get worried about scam sites because a lot of nasty individuals will put up fake donation sites when there's something like that. But given that, you know, this hit so close to home again, thank God, not where I live, but very close, uh, in some of the places, um, not all of them, but if you go to my Twitter, I did post the thing. If you want to donate to help people and red cross, I'm a little iffy on red cross, but I think some of the other ones look pretty reputable. Just because Red Cross has a history of fronts, and I think they've even had scandals about the money not going everywhere, for, going for memory. But there's about 10 different sites if you want to donate and help people out. Uh, so you can do your own research and look up the history of the different places to see which are the most reputable, which ones haven't had scandals about not giving people the donation money. Um, so at least that website that news article gave like 10 different options so yeah Tennessee is, is there's pros and cons to Tennessee you know what I mean I guess like anywhere but I've never we've never seen tornadoes like that that was like that was the next level that was the final boss of all tornadoes if you're playing a tornado video game you're that's the final boss and even if it's not the highest death toll. Um, that was probably the still the biggest, craziest outbreak. Because it's not just a matter of the death toll. It's also the size of the tornado. And the th this one went through five states, 225 miles of damage. That's crazy. Because usually a tornado touches down and then it leaves. Right? Like maybe, maybe it's on the ground for a few minutes and it you know messes up 10 houses that's the standard tornado i guess a f2 or 3 i don't know but an f5 is like winds of 200 miles an hour and gigantor final boss right so there's not really anything you can do <coughs> in an f5 tornado and so if you saw like places in kentucky i mean the only thing left standing was like buildings built 200 years ago. <laughs> so 1800s era brick buildings, which I guess they really knew what they were doing back then. They used quality materials. Everything else is just flat. It looks like a giant garbage dump. Now it's crazy. And uh, it'd probably be more than, I mean, if it's five states wide and entire towns are gone, it's probably more than a hundred people. It might be up in the two or three hundreds. And they said that they won't know how many people uh, it killed until like a week or two. Because there's all these people missing. Dozens and dozens of people. They don't even know where they're at. That's the crazy thing about a gigantor tornado. The people just go missing, dude. I'm not trying to be callous or mean. It's like that guy is no longer here his body we don't know we'll never find that they, they, they don't find everybody's body because it like i don't know if it gets ripped apart or like you got thrown a mile into the lake or you got thrown out in the middle of nowhere in the woods tennessee's all woods so <clears throat> it's crazy there was a story of kids in a bathtub that if they got in the bathtub the tornado hit 
And then they got out of the bathtub and they were like somewhere else in the neighborhood. That's how crazy tornadoes are. It's wild. <clears throat> so we were like going down into the basement of a parking garage in Nashville. And I got to thinking, well, they always say you don't want to be in a car. But if you're, I mean, wouldn't being in a car be better? It just seems like it would be better than be walking on the road. Like, what if you're out in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> right? You're just walking. You're out on a nature trip, and then a tornado comes, and they always say, no, get in a ditch. Oh, yeah. I guess I guess I can see the logic of the ditch thing. But if there's no ditches, like, what are you supposed to do? Uh, you don't want to be near the trees because the trees become projectiles. It just seems like even if the car gets thrown, don't you have a better chance? I don't know. I've, just, I've always wondered about the whole, like, what do you... What if you're in a car scenario? If I'm in a car and a tornado comes, should I get out of the car and get in the ditch? Not, I mean, they tell you to do that, but it's like, it just so it seems so counterintuitive. Like if I'm in the back seat, like hunkered down in my car, and the car gets thrown around, right? I mean, yeah, I might get like a broken arm or something, and. Something might bop me on the head and knock me out, but it just still seems because the cars don't look like they're sometimes they're squished and turned over, but they're usually just turned on their side and they don't look like they're completely like every now and then there's some that are completely demolished. Uh, there were some in the tornado a couple nights ago, but like if I was in a semi, like some of the semis, they just look like they're tipped over, you know what I mean? So I just, I don't, I don't, uh, the logic of it's weird to me, but. Definitely, obviously, you get to the basement. But see, in that kind of a tornado, they, they'll say, oh, get to the center of your house. Get to the center of your house, which I guess makes sense. But in an F5 tornado, the center of your house is not going to matter. The only thing that's going to matter is the basement. That's it. You, like, if you don't have a basement, you're screwed, dude. So, better go over to your buddy's house who has a basement. But, yeah, those are like, you know, those are the real things to be concerned about in the, in life, right? Not the coof, right? Fake things to be concerned about. Those are the real things to be concerned about. But it is, uh, you know, it's sad to see, you know, people nearby, all of their, some of these people are, they don't exist anymore and their towns don't exist anymore. So again, pray for these people and if you want to uh help them out there is the link on my twitter uh i can get it i'll get it and put it up here later if you're watching this later i'll put the link to where you can help out the people in the tornado but that was crazy um and i've been in multiple tornadoes you know where the sirens go off and you go to the basement and then i've been in one that was like i said over my apartment um but I've never seen anything like that. That was the that was the next level stuff. That was crazy. And some people said, could there have been um, G O E N G I N E E R I N G? Could be. I mean, I don't know that the extent to which the um, ionospheric technology can. I know that they can ramp up storms, but of course, it, you know, it's, it's very difficult to prove that it's hard to know when they're doing that. Uh, but I have read the uh, DARPA documents that discuss that they actually have, uh, I remember reading a DARPA document about what, 10 years ago, where they talked about trying to tap into the electricity of the lightning in storms. And then there's tech, you know, there's discussions of the actual Doppler systems also being weaponized to not just through radar you know uh map the storm but also to like heat it up uh, i th i have read that that is doable that that does exist so we'll see uh well i don't know that we'll ever see but it is possible um all right so a couple of things that we want to look at today 
before we get into the open forum and the Q&A and the Discord, uh, you know, typically what we've kind of done is the model where I do a little bit of a, uh, analysis and then we get to the open forum. And, uh, you know, we do that, of course, through Discord. You can also support the show through Super Chats via Streamlabs, and the Streamlabs link is there in the show description. So, let's see. There's that link if you want to ask questions via Streamlabs, and if you want to come on, you can do that via Discord. All right. Uh, just a couple thoughts today on issues uh, of controversy that pop up at times in relation to history, uh, geopolitics, and the church, and kind of a biblical philosophy of history that I've been thinking about this week. And this is relevant because, of course, we're coming up to nativity. And, you know, if you read the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel, of course, is crucial for us, at least for predicting the birth of the Messiah, especially Daniel 7, Daniel, well, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, all relate, in the case of Daniel 9 at least, to, you know, really intense precision on under which empire and what would be going on at the time of the birth of Messiah, right? From Daniel 9, 24 to 27, the famous 70 weeks, we have the explicit mention of the removal of the temple, the, the removal of the sacrifices, Messiah the Prince appearing, the bringing in of everlasting righteousness, the Messiah the Prince being cut off um, at the time when the sacrifice and offering is cut off, basically. And for, you know, Christianity, Orthodox Christianity particularly, this is concomitant with the first advent. So, of course, evangelical misinterpretation typically has this arbitrary pause button between the first week of Daniel's 70 weeks and then, oh, it jumps to 2,000 years later with the rapture and all this nonsense. No, the, it's, the, the time period is one time period. And there could have been, of course, uh, an immediate discussion in regard to some of the things, for example, that Daniel talks about relate to um, the intertestamental period of the Maccabees. So if you, like in chapters uh, 10, 11, you have predictions about uh, Antiochus and Alexander the Great. But Jesus in the Elvet Discourse, you know, in Luke 21 and Matthew 24, he refers to the abomination of desolation in Daniel that occurred during the, well, the first abomination of desolation is when the Babylonians and then, uh, well, for the, southern empire of judah so southern kingdom it's the babylonians right and then for the northern kingdoms it's the assyrians that destroy the northern kingdoms of israel but the point is that the defiling of the temple this first abomination is through uh the babylonians and what 586 and then you have under antiochus in the intertestamental period the next version of this abomination which daniel is in the literal sense, historical sense, referring to. So then when Christ in Luke 21, especially, it's very clear in Luke, and because Luke's written for a Gentile audience, it's even a little clearer than what's in Matthew 24, but it's the same all about discourse. And in Luke 21, he says, for this is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So in other words, Jesus is referring to this repeating pattern principle and of course, they, Jesus would have known, the writers of the gospel would have known that the historical, literal, immediate fulfillment of Daniel was Antiochus via Alexander the Great, <clears throat> right? When Antiochus comes in, uh, in, in what, mid-2nd mid century BC, and he sacrifices a pig on the altar, right? And that was intended to defile on purpose, thus abomination of desolation. So the repeating pattern that comes again in the first century is when Titus Vespasian comes in, marches in in 70 AD. They set the Roman banners of the pagan gods up in the temple to intentionally destroy, defile the, defile the temple <clears throat> before they raise it to the ground. 
So again, abomination of desolation, 586, Babylonians destroy the temple. Antiochus uh, sacrifices the pig on the altar in 2nd century BC. And then 70 AD, Titus Vespasian sets up the Roman pagan god banners in the temple, and then they destroy the temple. So that's three abominations of desolations where the, the temple's destroyed and defiled on purpose. <clears throat> and that is one of the key prophecies and predictions for Christians to say, look, what Daniel 9 is talking about is clearly what happens in 70 AD. And you have that prediction in Genesis 49, right, where it says that the royal lineage will continue through the house of David until Messiah the Prince comes. So it says that there will continue to be a lawgiver from Judah until Messiah the Prince. And to him will be the hope of the nations. So in other words, we're looking, according to Genesis 49, we're looking for, and the, the, even Jews who don't believe in Jesus, they admit that's a messianic text, right? <laughs> so just like in Daniel 9, we're looking for in the appearance of a Messiah figure from the tribe of David, from, the, from Judah, <clears throat> the line of the tribe of Judah, who will appear when there is, during this time frame, a abomination of desolation, a, a another a, a diaspora. And wouldn't you know, 70 AD was that last diaspora, you see. So this is the, Daniel is great because it's the Christocentric philosophy of history. So rather than history, for example, in uh, like the pagan view, in the pagan view, history is uh, cyclical. It's a trap. It's bad. It's evil. It's a lesser diminished status. And for the Greeks, especially in, in a lot of paganism, history is something that you flee from. You, you want to get away from time and space. It's bad. It's a lesser reality. And you could see why pagans would have reasoned that way, because if you look at the world, it's like, well, I mean, time and space is full of corruption, decay, death, bad things happen, you know, therefore they would say, maybe we got to, we got to run, we got to flee from time and space and history in the body. But the problem is that that's a false philosophy of history. And for us, especially Christianity is not a, uh, a purely ethereal mental reality, right? It's not a, uh, platonic realm in the ideal realm that we want to get back to uh, therefore we flee time and space Fly time and space is evil and even in uh extreme ascetic camps i'm not saying the church teaches extreme asceticism but i'm saying in various as as extreme as ascetic circles and even within times of the history of the church with originism the church has in various ways and amongst different members been tempted of course the church rejected originism but it was tempted with this ahistorical move history's bad get away from it um, and that's why the originist challenge is very dangerous is because on the one hand originism gives the appearance of a academically sophisticated solution to a lot of the so-called problems of the literal meaning of the text oh you know there's this m miraculous stuff in the old testament that's so wild and so crazy if we just allegorize it all such that there isn't a historical meaning and thus we learn to move away from history because it's bad it's evil it's diminished it doesn't exist etc then we have the true higher spiritual true gnostic sense and the problem of course is that that is a false dialectic and it's also again just fundamentally contrary to christianity christianity is a historic religion it's the second person of the godhead stepping into time and space and history and so it's a history affirming religion and that alone sets it in contrast to most of the greek hellenic mindset and the ancient pagan world <clears throat> With maybe the exception of Aristotle, you could argue that Aristotle is uh, more worldly focused, right? He's not about 
fleeing from the world like Plato or some sort of mysticism, Aristotle is a much more world affirming affirming philosopher. And so in that respect, he's a little more amenable to certain areas of Christian philosophy or biblical philosophy, such as the doctrine of creation and that God says it is good. And even after the fall, creation is still good, even though it's in a state of decay, entropy, corruption, etc. It doesn't mean that it's inherently bad or inherently flawed or something to run away from. And by extension, neither is the body something to run away from evil, punish your body because it's your body is not what caused you to sin. An evil heart causes one sin. Remember what Jesus says, it's not what enters the mouth that causes defilement but what proceeds out of the heart of man that defiles you. And that doesn't even mean your heart is bad. Nothing in itself is bad. It's the misuse, misappropriation of good things that is the source of, quote, bad or evil. And so likewise, neither could we say history is evil, neither could we say the body is evil, uh, material physicality is is evil. None of those things are evil. And so what we get in contrast to the wisdom of worldly philosophers and worldly thinkers and, and men of the world, you know, somebody like, ironically, even at times, even worldly thinkers think of a, a philosophy of history like Spangler. Even Spangler kind of like touches on elements that are kind of similar to what's in Daniel because Daniel pictures the world empires like these sections of a, of a statue, an idol, or these different beasts, and they kind of have a life and a death cycle. That's something that um, Spangler kind of uh, talks about that's similar to what's in Daniel. But here, there, there's a key difference here for <clears throat> the biblical philosophy of history that, as we said, sets it off against the world religions in general especially the Hellenic mindset, except for Aristotle. And that would be uh, the that history is linear. There is a beginning, there's a middle, and there is an end. The Alpha and Omega. So when Christ affirms, I am the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, he's essentially affirming his divinity and sovereignty and providence over history. And so we have to understand that there's a lot of different ways and types and elements of apologetic <clears throat> And one of those philosophies is the philosophy of history. Just like there's philosophy of mind and there's there's the philosophy of metaphysics and logic, there's also philosophy of history. What is time? The philosophy of time. If you read Father Staniloy's first volume of Orthodox Dogmatics, you notice that there's about a 60 or 80 page section (laughs) that goes super deep into the philosophy of time. If you read Lasky's Orthodox Dogmatics, you know there's at least two or three chapters on creation and the philosophy of time. And, uh, you know, many other Orthodox thinkers and philosophers have written on the philosophy of history and the philosophy of time. And the reason for that, again, is that, and this is partly why we could see somebody like Aristotle being a little more amenable to this Christian perspective than the Neoplatonists. And And again, I'm not trying to be overly simplified here yes Cappadocians for example were very influenced by elements of Neoplatonism that they appropriated for their Christology and their Trinitarian theology St. John Damascus more influenced by Aristotle than by Platonists but again that's not a either or we can pull from any of these schools where there's insights so uh, it's just way too oversimplified when people say oh orthodoxy is Neoplatonic oh uh, this is a essence inner distinction that's Aristotelian it's, it's more nuanced than that. The church fathers drew, drew insights from all over the place. The Porphyrian tree. The Aeneids. Uh, Aristotle. And so likewise, when it comes to the philosophy of history, telos. It's not just individual objects that have a purpose for Christian philosophy because the divine mind is the source of all reality. All of history has a telos, a purpose. And so when we read Paul's epistles, Ephesians, Paul says the purpose of the world is the church. So in Paul's mind, 
all of reality was created even originally in the garden with the purpose and intentionality of being Christocentric. And this is something Thomists and Roman Catholics, they can't fathom this. You go and look at, as I just covered in the video I posted today, where we looked at the replica of the Sistine Chapel. The first thing I noticed right away of the creation of Adam, yeah, there's the weirdness of imaging God the Father and all that. But just the idea of, so God the Father, number one, he's not supposed to be image, but he's reaching out and then Adam is like this. And so they're not even touching. It's like, that's the creation of Adam. That's not Adam after the fall. That's the creation of Adam. So a lot of people were analyzing this when we were going through the exhibit. And they were like, oh, you know, it's because Adam is created a little lower than the angels. And Adam is, uh, what, what did they say? Uh, you know, Adam is, is uh, sinful. And so he couldn't have the full perfect communion yet with God. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> this is not right in terms of the Genesis account. So first of all, if you look at Orthodox iconography, who do we see? in the garden in creation. And this is like just such an obvious no brainer, right? Who is the creator in Genesis? Christ. You always see Christ in icons of creation. You don't see an old man because God, the father is not incarnate. That's heterodox iconography because we don't, our theology has to reflect our, our, or excuse me, our iconography has to reflect the theology. So we can't make icons that teach filioque. We can't make icons that picture God the Father as an old man holding a baby. It's just, it's all crazy. That's not what we do. And that's what the Seventh Council is about. And again, it's ironic that what we see is that when Roman Catholics, for example, affirm the Seventh Council, we, we learn that it's only in name. They don't actually hold to the teaching of the Seventh Council. Because if they did, the Seventh Council says you don't image God the Father. In his hypostasis, there can be certain cases where the uh, idos of the father, just like the word F-A-T-H-E-R, is an image in a way of the father, but it's a representation of the father. It is not a direct representation of the hypostasis of the father, the way that an icon of Christ is a direct representation of his hypostasis. Likewise, if you don't know, the Orthodox Church does not represent the hypostasis of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? Did you know that a dove and tire, fires of uh, tongues of fire? That's not the hypostasis of the spirit. Those are his energetic manifestations. And there are a couple uh, 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 cases in which, again, there is an image of the idea of the father, but not the person of the father. But that's a separate topic. We won't go into that right now. But uh, this is just pointing out that in the famous, you know, renaissance image you have this distance between god the father and adam and this is very bizarre the more i thought about it, this is like demiurge neoplatonic philosophy and as you go through the rest of michelangelo's paintings you know it's hermetic stuff everywhere it's weird now there's some biblical things there but i but I, what i'm getting at is that the Renaissance art is a great example of this false synthesis between the ancient pagan ideals and the biblical motifs, especially the Old Testament. For one, because he gives, it's odd that he gives the Sibyls like the equal status of the Old Testament patriarchs in the top panels. That's bizarre. Again, I, I'm not denying the Sibyls. I think the Sibyls uh, were in, I don't know, I haven't studied every case, but I mean, yeah, it's very plausible that sure there were uh, predictions of Christ in the pagans. Yeah. But that doesn't, that they're not, they're not the same status as Old Testament patriarchs. That's very bizarre. Uh, but, the, but, but the artwork gives the impression that the Sibyls are the same as the Old Testament patriarchs. And that I think is kind of indicative that for those Renaissance guys, it's, it lends to that syncretic Neoplatonic approach. That's the point I'm trying to get at. Because when you get over to the final judgment, Christ is not the historical Christ. He's this 
buff superhero Italian dude. I mean, like the red, he- the the light reddish blonde type of Italian, right? Which is what the Southern Italians <laughs> not so not the like swarthy, you know, Michael Corleone Italians. The the wherever the the blondish Italians are from is on the Florence or Southern Italy. I don't. I've never been to Italy, but my point is that people tell me this that have been there, and I, one of my good friends lives in. Uh, lives in Florence or li- lives near near Florence. I forget where he's from, but in the middle, he's smack dab in the middle. So he's told me this. Um, but what what the whole reason I'm bringing in all the Michelangelo stuff is that the entire premise of the artwork there is a historical. You see, Jesus is not a, a super. He's not Thor. And however much you might want to do religious analysis, comparative religious analysis and archetypes, which there's a valid place to do that. Yeah, there are uh, remnants, the seeds of the Logos, Logos Spermaticos in the pagan religions and their myths. Sure, absolutely. And again, I believe that Virgil's fourth eclogue predicts Christ. I believe that there are Sibyls that predicted Christ. If Balaam, the prophet in numbers, a pagan prophet, can clearly prophesy of Christ, which he does, there's no reason why there can't be prophecies in the Sibyls. There's no reason why in Plato, right, there, right, there's Platonic dialogues where people have historically, classically said this seems to be a, a prediction of Christ. The, the righteous man that's persecuted and so forth. Uh, very similar to what we find in the wisdom texts, like in wisdom, the book of wisdom, I'm saying the Dewar canonical text. And, and it's entirely possible too, just to be very clear, that the Sibyls might have read Isaiah. Maybe the Sibyls read the Psalms. Remember, Bathsheba went across the world to talk to Solomon. So if Bathsheba can go across the world to meet with Solomon and hear his wisdom, which Solomon predicted Christ, it's entirely plausible that many other cultures right, would have and could have had exposure to Isaiah to David's uh, Psalms, etc. Again, that seems natural. So we shouldn't find it strange that there could be uh, predictions of Christ in pagan literature and pagan prophets. However, not exactly the same thing as raising them to the status of uh, Old Testament patriarchs, right? I, I think that that seems problematic. I don't. That doesn't make sense doing that. Uh, and and even and again, use the example of Balaam. I mean. We don't, even though Balaam predicts Christ in numbers, he doesn't get an icon, right? He's not, he's not equal to Abraham, right? Because he predicted Christ. I mean, even, even the high priest in the gospel, it says prophesied via the spirit that Christ would die for the nation. And so it's almost like he unwittingly prophesied, right? Again, as high priest, so he had that authoritative position and was able even to speak prophetically and perhaps even against the sense in which he intended to mean that Christ would be, prophesied, or would be crucified. But regardless, the text still says that, and it's either Annas or Caiaphas, it says being high priest that year prophesied that he would die uh, not for one, but for the whole nation. So if Balaam and if the high priest... Annas or Caiaphas can, can prophesy. There's no reason why the Spirit of God can't move these various Sibyls to prophesy. And thus we would get, that's why we would have the Magi, these pagan Magi, seeing his star and coming to see about the birth of the Messiah in Bethlehem. Sure, yeah. I mean, they... Do, do we think that the Magi wouldn't have heard of Isaiah or David? Sure. Right. They would have. Very likely they read David's Psalms. And go read Virgil's fourth eclogue. This is another famous case of this. So uh, Constantine, St. Constantine, you know, famously talked about Virgil's fourth eclogue being a prediction of Christ. And uh, it's, it's totally biblical that even the pagan prophets would speak of Christ coming. Even Plato, even uh, dialogues. But the point of that is that 
the fact that there's pagan predictions does not it doesn't follow from that that biblical revelation and the teaching of the church is like on the same par as hellenic philosophy you see that's the fallacy here and as you walk through the sistine chapel panels and you decode them and look at all the meanings and whatnot you start to realize that the genesis account and the biblical figures are completely divorced from the historical presentations well i shouldn't say completely because like in the in the the account of noah there's like a giant it looks like a giant gondola (laughs) so it's i mean it was cracking me up that michelangelo paints noah's ark like a giant gondola (laughs) you can imagine so like uh, better hop on the ark. There's going to be a big storm. A lot of rain coming. We got plenty of post. Get in the side of the gondola before the rain comes. It will be the 40 days and the 40 nights. Anyway, uh, it literally looks like a, like a giant gondola, like a giant houseboat gondola. That's what the ark was. Anyway, so it's not completely divorced, but I mean, it, like the people. So the women are all dudes, by the way, if you didn't know this, apparently for whatever reasons, and I guess it's debated as to the reasons why uh, Michelangelo didn't use female models. Um, Apparently, he used dudes for the chicks, and so, and these dudes all have, like, giant glutes. I'm talking, like, junk in the trunk. Not just giant glutes, but, I mean, like, they got, like, giant everything, basically. So it's just weird, right? Like, so he's got like this basically a gigantic buff Sybil, like way buffer than any dude you know will ever be. And then like these little, like lemons, lemon breasts with finger sized nipples. It's just bizarre. Anyway, I don't really care about this body styles or whatever uh and tiny wee wees by the way apparently everybody before the modern era had tiny wee wees i don't know like like everybody's got tiny wee wees back then or did they was that i don't know <laughs> anyway anyway they got big old they got junk in the truck everybody's got giant glutes junk. it's just bizarre dude and contrast this with orthodox iconography and again the point t- to today's talk is about the fact that it's all a historical, and so basically, it's a move in the direction of the Neoplatonizing Hermetic idea that what is recorded in the scriptures is not so much these events that occurred, but these mythological meanings. In the same way that the Greek myths are mythological meanings that have, I don't know, practical value for you to decode, right? So, in a weird way even though i remember when i was a trad in my 20s you know i hate dan brown dan brown now dan brown is a complete goober i mean it's just just idiotic stuff but there's an element to which actually i was wrong dan brown was actually kind of right because the renaissance painters and the artists and i think it's all of them too right it's bernini and it's all of them it's all the ninja turtles basically (laughs) donatello michelangelo uh and and if you want a deeper analysis of this you can go watch the video that i did with uh, father vladimir on um his analysis of the renaissance art so so in other words the darren brown analysis is idiotic and dumb but there is an element to which actually that's kind of true because they were not just operating on the principle of the teachings of the councils and the canons that's the key here is that the artwork departs from the ecumenical council's norms about liturgy and artwork. And it's that way for a reason. There's a reason why you don't depart from the seventh council because it starts to teach pagan ideas. That's the point here. And what I mean by pagan ideas is specifically the ahistorical anti-historicity approach that's originistic. If you read St. Gregory Palamas, for example, when he talks about icons, if you read the Ospensky book, there's a chapter on Palamas and iconography. It actually points out that one of the key disputes in the iconoclast controversy was the affirmation of the events being literal and historical. 
Yes, one of the purposes of iconography is to reaffirm the historicity of the events. Yes, the Abraham really looked like that because he was an actual person in history. Abraham is not an archetypal Carl Jung myth that everybody kind of aspires to or something like this. Right? Jesus is not a universal archetype that you paste onto him an Italian redheaded dude or a, a buff Thor or a, a blonde a blue haired Aryan dude. That's not, none of that works. Totally ahistorical. You can't do the Jesuit Chinese Jesus because Jesus wasn't a Chinese guy. Nothing against Asian peoples. God is the creator of all peoples, but Jesus wasn't Asian. It's like a no-brainer, right? We have to, in other words, the, the argumentation of the council and the theologians of the council, John Damascus, St. Theodore, uh, Sudite, is precisely that the iconography has to be limited by the actual historical realities because Jesus has to be a descendant of Abraham and of David. He can't be a descendant of Qingdai, he can't be the descendant of the Zulu nation. Okay, again, and he's able to encapsulate all human nature because he's a divine person. So it's, it doesn't require that he be incarnated in every race. This is another one of the Nestorian elements to this heretical iconography is that it's Arian slash Nestorian. It's as if Jesus can't, reach the humanity of all of the nations because he's it's like it's Jesus was a good dude who morally like ascended to godhood that's the the assumption of the heterodox iconography which then on that a Nestorian basis then has to basically try to paint Jesus in every race it's just it's just weird and it's it's not there's a reason why. That's why the Orthodox Church has the same icon. Basically, right? But you can see, though, the. it was just so obvious to me looking at the particularly the painting of the creation of Adam where you have a, a an untouched, like God can't touch Adam because God is this old guy in the clouds, it's like a demiurge. And it's the opposite of orthodox iconography. It always, it's Christ is in the garden creating Adam and Eve. And it's, you see him blessing Adam and Eve in most of the, you know, orthodox icon, icons of Genesis and creation. Christ is creating the heavenly spheres. And there's a direct communication and presence in Michelangelo's there it's not there's a space between them they're cut off and remember this is not after the fall because there's a separate painting where Adam and Eve are being sh shushed out of shoo shush out of paradise by the cherub so this is the creation this is not post fall and there's there's a divide there's a gap which doesn't make sense because Adam and Eve were not cut off in the, cre the original creation. They had the direct communion via the energies and the life of the Holy Spirit until they sinned. Then they were cut off. And then even after that, it's restored. The communion is restored via the incarnation of Christ. And so in other words, just immediately from the outset, the theology is heterodox because it's not Christ that's a creator. It's a demiurge. Jesus is this buff mystical dude, like Thor, but not a god, but like a dude who became a god. And it was like, wow, this this is the whole philosophy and theology of this Renaissance Sistine Chapel is Arian, Nestorian, syncretic, perennialist, Neoplatonic. And that is precisely why many of the 
people who study this point out, oh, yes, everyone in this period is obsessed with Renaissance magic and alchemy, and they're all going to... And what's the whole point of the, the great work of alchemy is the perfecting of man. Man's ascent to apotheosis, where Jesus is not the second person of the Godhead who steps into time and space to save you. Jesus is an archetypal image of the ascent to Godhood through secret gnosis, you see. That's what it is. So I'm leaving you like, I'm giving you like the the real Dan Brown here. We're doing like meta Dan Brown, real Dan Brown level stuff. This is the real Da Vinci code, even though it's the Michelangelo code. And they said, I don't, I have no idea this is true. I don't, it doesn't really bother me either way. I'm not wedded to Michelangelo, but they said that he might not have liked ladies, uh, which is interesting because they, they don't portray that in the Charlton Heston movie, <laughs> Agony and Ecstasy. But if you watch the Jeremy Irons Borgias, they do portray that. Michelangelo has a friend. So, anyway, I think you get the point here is that all of that to say that, like, we got to get our philosophy of history from Revelation. We don't do a bunch of Greek philosophy, and then we'll look at what Hebrew revelation says down the road. No, Daniel is the philosophy of history. Genesis is the philosophy of history. The New Testament writings are the philosophy of history, not Neoplatonic, ahistorical, mystical, al alchemical ascent into uh, being an avatar or something, right? And this is, again, uh, you know, I'm not trying to harp on Jordan Peterson, uh, we hear good things that Jordan Peterson continues to be open to and move in the direction of orthodoxy. And I think that's great. We, we definitely always say, pray for Jordan Peterson to be converted, but that's precisely the contention that we have is that if you listen to the Zizek Peterson debate, the conception that Peterson has of Jesus is a, an Aryan Nestorian Jesus who is a, just a dude that underwent these struggles and he becomes this archetypal uh, literary figure that you try to identify with. And this just totally misses the point of the Bible and Jesus. And I'm not saying that because I don't like or hate Jordan Peterson. It's not, that's not the point. The point is just strictly where I see the point of departure and the point of contention is that you have to accept the historicity of the Gospels and the Old Testament because, the, guess what? The Gospels presupposes the historicity of the Old Testament. And that's really the, the hard pill for people to swallow. So we talk about white pills and red pills. And what about the Bible pill? <laughs> what about the Genesis? It's time to take the Genesis pill, dog. You can take all them other pills, okay, whatever. But uh, red pills, white pills, they don't even matter really unless you take the historicity of the text pill. I'm sorry, but that's true. And yeah, it's a process. Not everybody immediately jumps on that. So it's sometimes it's difficult. We it's hard to believe that at times. So God spoke the world into existence. There's all these miraculous events happening in the Bible. Uh well, yeah. Exactly. Anyway, so what we see then is the, the historicity of the text when we depart from it. And it's precisely after the Seventh Council that we see East and West. I mean, there's other indicators too, but the, the Seventh Council is one clear point of departure in so far as Rome, the West, does not accept the Synodicon, for example. So we see then the disputes about uh, the, the creed under St. Photius and the Franks. We see the dispute over Charlemagne's theologians rejecting the Seventh Council, for example. We see then later on the Western captivity of the church. Papacy moves to Avignon. We see then the flowering after that of Renaissance papacy. We have Borgias, Medicis, Alexander VI. Uh, and then we see, again, clear innovations in where the Roman Catholic Church goes further and further away from what 
anybody reading the seventh council could see is like the seventh council's theology of the icon of the energies it's just night and day with this Sistine Chapel, my Michelangelo, you know, Alexander the Sixth stuff. This is just crazy stuff. This is way out there. And so the Renaissance Franco Papal Medici Borgia Church is this other thing. It's this weird thing. And guess what? All of the weird stuff that everybody talks about, it was going on then, <laughs> especially in those. Go, I would say actually watch the Borgias. Go watch that TV show because, I mean, it, it seems like it's pretty accurate. And I don't usually say go watch TV shows because they're accurate because usually they're not. <laughs> I mean, we we do a lot of deconstructing and, you know, decoding of propaganda and, and that kind of stuff in film and TV. But, uh, you know, that one actually surprised me because I didn't expect that show. I've only seen season one, but I didn't expect it to have so much geopolitical intrigue so it's almost like real game of thrones and that was another point i wanted to make which is that you know the real course of history of god's people is not divorced from intrigue uh i, I mean have you read the books of the kings and chronicles have you read the many times kings are conspiring to assassinate kill whole villages and then judith esther they're involved in espionage. Caleb and the spies. I mean, it's bizarre to me that it's very clear in the church. I mean, even in the early church, you have let the catechumens depart precisely because in the early church, the government would send spies in and they would lie about what the Christians were up to. They thought they were cannibals. They thought they were doing uh, O-R-G-I-E-S. And so you have the weeding out of spies through the catechumen process. That's part of the basis for the catechumen process is to keep out infiltrators, government spies, liars, phonies, etc. Uh, and so the knee-jerk reaction that a lot of modern so-called Christians, Orthodox Catholics have to the reality of the geopolitical influence and struggle in the church is bizarre to me. It's odd. Uh, and again, it just seems contrary to just the biblical presentation of history. I mean, the Bible is full of conspiracies. And it doesn't really matter whether you the word conspiracy, if that term is uh, offensive to you, has been weaponized, then just think about it as geopolitical intrigue, espionage. Okay, Does anybody think that espionage doesn't happen? There's no such thing as geopolitical in intrigue. Uh, and yet we have so many boomer docs who just lose their lid when I talk about these topics. And they're just so obvious and fundamental to the reality of history and the world. And we're right in the middle of a gigantic geopolitical problem with the Ukraine and with Russian church and the EP. And it's in everybody's face. Oh, but don't talk about that. You're not qualified. To, I'm more qualified to talk about it than any of you are. I mean, I can actually talk to people who <laughs> have studied these topics their whole lives, right? People who were involved in the Cold War, people who have written on this topic so all these that that's a bizarre ignorant form of criticism that i really don't understand and i don't know if it's coming from a place of malice if it's coming from a place of of just pure ignorance uh but i mean it's just bizarre to me that i mean I, I, the same people who make that criticism will talk for example about the courtly intrigues of the Franks and their influence to change the church. And if I talk about courtly intrigues today of the State Department trying to influence and change the church, they lose their lid and think I'm some sort of lunatic. Uh, what are you talking about? So are humans, they don't operate now the way they did in the time of the iconoclast controversy when the emperor was trying to change the church? Oh, now we don't have that problem? There's no influence of the state anymore? I mean, just come on, dude. Get, get real. It's time to grow up and face reality. And we're not in the boomer era, era of the 90s where you just don't talk about this stuff. It's in everybody's face. It's all over the news. It's all over the internet. People talking about the EP in Moscow. And I mean, what do you mean don't talk about it? Everybody talks about it. So... 
just the data of Revelation itself consistently talks about geopolitical intrigue in relationship to God's people. And so it's just very bizarre to me that people who present themselves as these sort of wise uh, figures in the church, especially boomer docs, will literally tweet the people that are involved in the State Department stuff and then say that you can't talk about this going on in the church when they're literally retweeting the people that do it. It's just like either they're totally dumb or they're malicious. And I don't either way. It's like you got to deal with what you got to deal with. And by the way, in the next couple of years, it's not going to be easy for a lot of these people. I mean, the people that have really buckled down, doubled down on uh, worshiping this system. I mean, you're going to get what you chose is coming to you. Not by me, but by your own providential decisions, you will, uh, what do the Proverbs say, right? Like the evil man traps himself in his own designs. Okay, well, so you buy into the delusion, you buy into this, and you're going to get what, right? Every man will get what he has chosen, basically. So you can be angry at me all day long and fuss about me, but it's going to come home to roost very soon. And I don't say that with any pleasure, but it's just crazy. Like, things are so wild, dude. Stuff is just crazy right now. And it's almost to the point where there's just no point in talking about it to people. I mean, I've been here talking about these things for 15 years, 20 years total on the internet, talking about stuff 13 years. And yeah, early on, I was immature. I got a lot of things wrong. But I've gotten better at my analysis, and I've been right about a lot of things over the the years. Uh, And most of the things in the last seven years I've talked about, I would say I was 90% right. There was a couple things I misread, misinterpreted, got my analysis wrong. I'm speaking geopolitically here. So, but, and I should do a stream where I just go back and, like, document all the things I was right about. But for some people who are malicious and sort of double down, I, that's, they don't care. That's not going to matter. It's that it's never going to change. There's not, nothing's going to matter because they don't love the truth. And that's what Paul says in second, second Thessalonians is that the delusion comes upon the people who don't love the truth. And so the delusion is its own punishment. So the punishment is you get what you chose the delusion and the delusion becomes the punishment because you self-destruct. That's the thing. And, and most wicked, evil people, this is what wicked people don't understand, is that they self-destruct. They're their own worst enemy because they, they keep doing the things that are damaging to their own soul, body, psyche, mental, spiritual health. But they can't help themselves precisely because the more that you invest in the delusion the, the more energy you put into the delusion the more you're in the delusion and so then it, it takes just even more of a move of grace right to repent to get out which is not impossible at any point god can grant repentance and, and these people can repent um and that's you know that's what we hope for so I'm not talking about anybody in specific there. I'm just speaking in general about the, you know, the constant criticism of, well, you don't need, you're not supposed to talk about these topics. Who are you to talk about these? Well, so people who are wrong, factually, consistently, that's who we should listen to. I mean, I'm, if I'm 90% right in my predictions and analyses over the last five to seven years that's a better track record than the people that are telling you to continue to double down and and worship the system (laughs) i mean so okay whatever um but the whole point of that is just to say that the bible tells us of the importance of history the bible tells us of history being linear in contrast to the pagan view if we look at the sistine chapel as an example of why being a historical causes problems, we see that the theology of the Sistine Chapel is heterodox. Uh, by the way, I do appreciate the art. Again, uh, if you go listen to the, the talk that we did with Father, Father Vladimir on the history of the Renaissance, uh, this is not to attack all forms of Renaissance art. This is not to attack 
uh, realism or any of the styles of art. That's not the point. The point is that for Orthodox liturgy, it has to be a certain way because of the theology. Now, in museums and in art houses, I'm not a Puritan. I'm not some super prudish dude. I, you, I have, you know, under, I, yeah, you can paint a nude sketch that doesn't t tempt me to lust. I, I don't gigantic bulbous females in paintings it does not tempt me to lust i mean nor do gigantic buff dudes with tiny wee wees that, that is not a temptation to me but so i'm not trying to erect some puritanical standard of what art houses and museums can and can't have i'm i'm a i'm fairly i think flexible with, with that kind of stuff in regard to what's reasonable uh i mean i don't think we should have degenerate art i don't think we should have prawn art uh right so i'm not i'm trying to have a balance here is at least what i think is acceptable here um but that's different from what's in the, the church in the liturgy and that's for a reason that's the point here and so sistine chapel is a, a great example of an ahistorical approach which i can appreciate the art uh, if if Rome if, if if Italy and Rome became Orthodox, we could turn the Sistine Chapel into a, a museum or something, right? I mean, it could be some kind of great art museum, uh, but it's it can't because well, number one, we don't want to destroy it, but at the same time, it's it can't be an Orthodox church. It could be, you know, a great museum piece. There's nothing wrong with that. But the church is different. The church is a heaven on earth liturgy, and it has to abide by the ecumenical norms of the first seven councils that's why you can't go off into uh the neoplatonic gnostic demiurge ethos once you've immersed yourself for example in like orthodox iconography meaning symbolism uh presentation when, you, when you're really imbibed in that tradition then when you look at the Renaissance stuff, it, it's very bizarre. It's like unnatural, weird. It does not teach what the Orthodox icons teach, even though I can still appreciate the skill, the talent, the beauty, the symmetry, the harmony, the, you know, all this stuff. But I mean, there, there's plenty of artists that are pagan, that are, you know, atheist even, that, that are great at what they do, right? But that's has really has nothing to do with what's appropriate in the liturgical setting of the church. And this is, again, just a great explanation of why the Seventh Council is a key pivot point for this issue. And why, believe it or not, the Seventh Council is actually a big proof for the historicity of the Bible and the text. Because the argumentation about the icons is that they must depict what the people and the events were historically that's the key here now it doesn't mean that they're only historical obviously icons are uh they're historical and they're above historical they tra they both and so they're historical and they transcend time and space it's a both and relationship go listen to the interview that we did with uh jonathan pajot on this topic we had a great discussion on the fact that icons can present time and space and events in a transcending time and space event way. So don't misunderstand me as if it's an either or, oh, it's either temporal or it's, it's eternal. It's no, no time and space. History is not in a dialectic with eternity in the Orthodox view. And this is fundamental to Orthodox iconography. And if you read uh, the Auspensky book with Lasky, there's great chapters, especially the chapter on Palamas and icons. And that critiques the Renaissance pagan approach, which is ahistorical. That's the point. But why do we be, have to be historical? Because of the book of Daniel. Because of Genesis. Daniel is giving you a philosophy of history that predicts when Jesus would come. In history. So <laughs> it's precise. Don't you get that it's... it's historically precise he's telling you historical events that occur like the destruction of the temple when you see the temple gone no more sacrifices 
That is one of the key signs that Messiah has come. When you see Messiah cut off, he died. Go listen to the video I did, what, two or three years ago on Daniel. We talked about this. All right, so uh, that's why my philosophy of history, philosophy of geopolitical intrigue from the Bible, philosophy of iconography in contrast to where we can see an example of the Western Renaissance pagan Roman church going awry. So now we'll open up to uh, Discord. I don't know who's in the Discord. Uh, so we will have Q&A. Uh, and then uh, whoever wants to can bring their objections. They can bring their uh, questions. Doesn't have to be objections. But if you do want to debate, you can have the floor. As you know, we give people, the opponents, the floor. They can make whatever objections they want. They can have as long as they want within reason. You can't talk for three hours telling me how uh, evil of a KGB sorcerer you think I am. You have to, the, the, the criteria are you have to present arguments. Um, and you can make those arguments as long as you want. You can say whatever arguments you want. And we will open up now. Welcome, everybody. And also, uh, you can ask questions via super chat that is the Streamlabs link so you can ask typically i mean you can ask whatever you want i mean it might be cool if there was questions related to the topics that we discussed it doesn't have to be if you want to talk about tag or if you want to talk about uh, the papacy whatever you can talk about but uh we'll open it up and we kind of go back and forth if you're new to this from the questions in the discord live to uh people's super chats so anybody in discord want to voice an objection or ask a question i have a question okay what's your name my name is zachary what's up zach how you doing um yeah i bought the papacy by big by gute mm -hmm. back a, a week ago and i was reading through it and i'm wondering how is this an authentic is everything that he says there like really really scholarly because i've looked at some of he talks about how pope saint gregory the great denied universal jurisdiction and i've looked at some catholics responding to this and they make some interesting points and i'm, I'm just wondering was gete refuted on any of this stuff or is everything he say he says like like really good well i think there are obviously any time an Orthodox person writes something, there will be a Roman Catholic response. And if I recall, I think maybe like people like Orestes Brownson, I think might have replied to the book. Um, and to be clear, yes, in one sense, since he wrote that in what, like late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, it is somewhat dated because, of course, scholarship has progressed in the last hundred years. So I'm sure there are Roman Catholic responses, but it's still good in terms of, generally speaking, something from that time period. And he actually ended up going Orthodox, right? So he went. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right. So uh, now in regard to Gregory the Great, I mean, one example that I can back up, you know, this this argument is, you know, he has a letter where he says that the Petrine Sea is Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch, right? Yeah. Okay, well, so modern Roman Catholics do not say that. The only Petrine yeah, Sea yeah, is yeah. Rome. So, in other words, that even even if he thought there were canonical privileges that he had as Bishop of Rome, which I'm sure he did in certain instances, that doesn't that doesn't translate to Vatican I because the yeah. disp the dispute is about precisely what Vatican I says. And and from our vantage point, if there is innovation, then Vatican I can't be have always been the case and you'll notice that roman catholic apologists they will kind of flip-flop between on the one hand they'll make the argument the way vatican one words it that it was always from earliest days known across the entire universal church that rome had this supremacy and fallibility and jurisdiction but then you'll yes. hear other roman catholics contradict that by saying well no it was a seed thing that evolved over time and so <laughs> So, and now both of those can't be true. So I would argue that no, actually the Roman Catholic has the uh, the burden to prove that it was as Satis Cognitum and Vatican I say, always known from the earliest days in all the church. Yeah, so do you just look at church history and then try to compare it to Vatican I and this is how you can refute it? In a way, I think a better approach rather than going into... I, I think it's it's necessary to go into the quote mines. By the way, the Denny book is also really good. Papalism by Edward yeah. Denny. Yeah. Um, but 
it's necessary to deal with each of the quote minds, but a better approach to specifically this question, we I think, is to look at the canons of the seven councils and then just to compare that to the full 15-page documentation documents of Vatican I. And yeah, so okay. we collected in the, in the Discord, Seraphim put together 13 or 15 pages of the canons in the first seven councils that don't make sense with Vatican I. And that's not the argument that Roman Catholics says, oh, who cares about canons? They're not infallible. That's not the argument. The argument is not the canons are infallible and this proves Vatican I, or disproves it. The argument is that the canons give us the mindset of the church in each one of these councils. And so basically every ecumenical council having multiple canons that contradict the mindset and claims of Vatican I shows that Vatican I is not the mindset of the seven ecumenical councils. Okay, yeah, that's great. I'm, I, I'm, I'm done here. Okay, that's, sure. thank yeah. you. If you look in the PDF bank, uh, Seraphim's... Uh, paper there is is easily accessible it's one it's one of, i think that's the easiest way i mean you can go into each of the quotes from you know every single saint and that's what denny and gate do and and um i'm sure brownson has his responses but uh, i think that's a much easier approach because i mean you, you can just for you can never you can read these re rebuttals and replies ad infinitum it never ends yeah and really both roman catholics and Orthodox agree that this or that saint actually doesn't prove it. Yeah. So what is going to prove it? Well, the dogmatic statements in the councils and the popes, that's what's going to prove it. So you're right to, I guess, I mean, I'm not discounting your question about Pope St. Gregory, but I mean, I, I think there's enough things in Pope St. Gregory that challenge the Vatican one view that it should be evident that he's not arguing the Vatican one view. Yeah. Okay. Right, well, thank you. I'm a big fan. Thank you for talking to me. Hey, thank you, man. Appreciate it, Zach. All right, see ya. Later, dude. Anybody else? Yo, Jay, I have a question. Hey, man, what's up? Yeah, uh, yes, my question is just, um, uh, is, is theosis, is that a belief that is exclusive to the Orthodox Church, or does the West have their own theories about it? Well, certainly many Western fathers use the term divinization. Uh, the Catholic Catechism uses the term deification. Um, Aquinas mentions deification. Um, Uniates, um, you know, the Eastern Catholics believe in deification and theosis. So, uh, no, strictly speaking, it's not wrong. But the question rather is, does it actually work and make sense given the rest of Roman Catholic theology? So that's what we would critique is that it's not that you uh, necessarily claim there is no deification or theosis. It's that you claim it, but then you also have these doctrines in your theology which discount it and negate it. For example, oh, okay. for example, created okay. grace, that the grace itself grace is, itself is. Uh, a created uh -huh. accident in the soul. Okay, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, I've been reading about, like, deification, mm -hmm. and since I've been... Because I didn't when I was when I was younger, I had both experience in Protestantism and Catholicism. Mm -hmm. and when I was younger, they never really talked about that much. So, right. but now that because when I was a kid, I was always confused about like I was always confused about the whole story of the Bible. Once I understood the deification, I was like, oh, this makes more sense. It makes more sense why Jesus came in the flesh. And all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think it's it's but you know both Roman Catholics and Orthodox. There, there's so much of this discussion in Scripture and in the Fathers that nobody's going to outright just say there is no deification outside of Protestantism. Protestants and evangelicals will say this, but uh, I mean, there's just so much, so many quotations and so much data and so many verses that discuss it, that it's very difficult to just outright deny deification. But the question is whose theology can really account for it. And actually the best text on this is if you read the debate with the Barlamite, Dialogue between Orthodox and a Barley Might, which uh, don't get it on Amazon if you go to SNUY Press, uh, the website, and order it directly from SNUY Press. It's $20, not $500 on Amazon. And that's a 80-page debate, 100-page debate between uh, Gregory Palamas and Akindinos. And the debate originally begins about the energies, and then it moves into discussing how do we participate in God. If God is absolutely simple... And if grace is fundamentally a creation in itself, then it doesn't make sense to say that we are deified because St. Gregory Palmas argues that would make 
uh, that would have that would be two gods, the uncreated God and the created God that you participate in. So grace itself has to be an uncreated reality, which is the very energies of God himself. God's love, God's justice, God's mercy. Uh, those are the things that we li we literally pr participate in that. God's glory, Jesus says in John 17. Well, does anybody actually believe God's glory is created? No. Okay, but then the Roman Catholic Church says that that light, that glory that is seen in, on, in Matthew 17 is a, is a created light. So that's fundamentally contradictory to Orthodox theology. We can never say that. It's the very thing that the Barleyamite and Palamas debate. And so, no, what we, what we participate in is the very life, love, wisdom, justice, mercy, and glory of God himself. And that's not a creature. And Roman Catholic theology very explicitly says, read Ludwig Gott, it says very clear that it's a uh, accidental created substance. In the, it's a created accident in the soul, excuse me. Okay, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, could, could you also say that about like created grace? Because I know it kind of ties in. Can you also say that created grace, can you debunk created grace by saying that if grace is created because it's created, it also requires salvation? And, yeah, that's an um, argument that Palamas like, makes. He says that how can you be saved by another creature? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it would require the same kind of salvation. That's why yep. Jesus would be a divine. Yeah, he, yeah says, okay. he, he says it's Arian. He says, yeah, okay, yeah, then yeah. Jesus was a guy who attained godhood. Yeah, okay. All right, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for asking my question. I'm sure. glad you're uh, all safe over there, and you know, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people reached out, asked. Uh, uh, I don't think we had any damage here in, in my town, and um, I think there was maybe a little damage in North Nashville, but most of the damage was uh, Kentucky, so... Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll preface by saying that I'm currently theologically homeless. So pardon me if I um, confuse some of my categories as I'm investigating a multitude of different traditions. But uh, That's okay. the question I have is, um, so I know that on a more ecumenical front, there's mm -hmm. many people who want to um, say that actually we agree more in theology between denominations, um, but we are only differ in linguistics. And I'm obviously very skeptical of that because oftentimes they're wrong about that claim. Um, but I've been looking, as I've been looking at the differences between the East and the West in regard to sin, and particularly original sin, um, I have a question on what's the difference, because when I read, I've been reading St. Gregory of Nyssa, right, and he talks about how, um, you know, sin and evil does not have substance in itself, but it is only generated as a privation of good. He says that, I mean, a being is composed by decision when there is any withdrawal um, of the soul from the good. But then he also talks about how um, because of um, because of this generated evil now that was um, composed of volition, now um, man's sensual faculty kind of has this inclination towards towards evil, which seems very similar to the Augustinian notion of concupiscence. So um, and so what would be the difference be between the two if because if concupiscence is sin, then wouldn't also our um, you know our inclination towards non-being also be sin so they would actually be quite similar they would just be using a um, different language okay so uh several things there to parse out first thing is that um e even in augustine he, there's a distinction between our inclination to non-being or privation and the moral problems of the movement of the will away from the good so in other words th th this is a distinction that's not really uh, disputed in the church fathers between different notions of evil. So the word evil sometimes can refer to just a pure privation. For example, uh, if a man is blind, he lacks sight. That's an evil that he's undergoing. That's distinguished from, and that's an evil of privation. That's distinguished from moral evil. So if I will to, you know, kill some dude, that's a moral move of the will away from the good. So that, the two different uh, notions there. And I, I, if I recall, it's been many years. I've read a lot of Augustine. And I mean, I took his name when I became Roman Catholic. Uh, but it has, it has been a while since I've read Augustine. But if I recall, I mean, even he makes that kind of a distinction. So that's one little thing to, to uh, clarify. But let's, let's move to the bigger picture of what is the real distinction between the Augustinian view 
of original sin and the orthodox view that is sometimes called uh, ancestral sin, although really the orthodox position, it, there's no problem with the words. We don't have a problem using the word original sin. It's just that so often that's, conf that's identified with the Augustinian view. Now, the Augustinian view is first and foremost a, a specific view of Romans 5 uh, and the text in Romans that deal with Adam as the um, archetype of man. And this is where Augustine went wrong was that he, his, his <clears throat> Neoplatonic views uh, were operant when he read Romans 5 and he viewed Adam, all of mankind in Adam as a kind of archetypal ball, you could say, so that this led Augustine to say and teach his doctrine of mas damnata. So if you don't know about this, you need to know that Augustine had the view that Adam and all of his descendants are a damned mass. Okay, the mass damnata. Mm -hmm. Everybody is in a giant ball that's going to hell. All of us. And so Adam is this archetypal figure of man by which all of Adam's action. Well, let's, let's say the fall. Adam's fall extends in guilt and action and consequence to all of his descendants. So Augustine literally thinks that I am there with Adam, even though I didn't exist. I was in potentia <laughs> as one of Adam's descendants. I was there with him sinning by virtue of being in him. So this is at, uh, this is Augustine's archetypal view of covenantal headship. And so would this be, um, would that be akin to the reform notion of federal headship? Well, Augustine did not have that notion of federal headship, but that is the origin of the idea of federal headship. Yes. It's his reading of Romans five. Okay. Now let's be clear here because Augustine is not, the same as the Calvinist. Calvinism will be a development of Augustinian theology, but don't misunderstand and think that, oh, Augustine's a Calvinist. It's way more nuanced than that. So, but before we move to that, let's, let's understand what Augustine thinks. So he thinks that that's the state of everybody, including infants. And so he believes very logically consistent, I guess you could say on this reading of Romans five, that all in Adam are equally sinning, equally guilty, and equally damned. And this includes literally everybody, babies. Every infant, damned. Mm -hmm. So for Augustine, and he always taught this, he never, uh, to my knowledge, um, moved away from this. And there, I have an essay on this. Even the Vatican has clarified this, the Vatican clarification on limbo. Uh, from the time of Augustine to Pope St. Gregory the Great even, Gregory the Great believed the same thing as Augustine, the dominant view in the West is that any infant that does not make it to the baptismal font is damned. Because in Augustine's view, he believed in baptismal regeneration. He believed that the elect, who are a fixed predestined number, that they will be baptized. So in other words, within God's providence, God has arranged history such that every elect person and even infant will make it to the baptismal font to receive baptismal regeneration, as well as living their lives right in Christ and eventually getting what he calls the gift of perseverance. So the elect get the gift of perseverance as well to make it to the end. He who endures to the end shall be saved. So that's the Augustinian view of how he both believes in predestination and baptismal regeneration and in the, uh, that, that sort of archetypal federal headship view. So that dominates from, Augustine to Gregory the Great in the West. And then after Gregory the Great, you start to get theologians in the West sort of softening this. And then you eventually get what is dogmatized in Rome in the Middle Ages is the limbo of infants. Well, it doesn't really make sense to say that infants are guilty of both original sin and actual sin, which is a distinction that the Roman Catholic Church makes, which I think Orthodox theology makes eventually too, to distinguish between this, our status in Adam and individual guilt for willful knowing actions of sin. So there's a distinction between these. So what is the Orthodox view? The Orthodox view does not and did not read Romans 5 in the same way as Augustine, and thus the ecumenical councils, although they do condemn things like Pelagianism uh, and uh, um, Donatism, for example, that Augustine fought against, it, that, that, it doesn't mean that the orthodox canons and councils accepted all of Augustine's view. So keep in mind that in the West, Augustine's influence was so big, so strong, so heavy 
that it dominated for centuries in the West, but it was never dominant in the East. And this is why St. Photius has lengthy thing, areas where he discusses precisely why the, the East does not accept all of Augustine's positions, neither on this issue of original sin nor on filioque. So then what is the Orthodox view? So the Orthodox view is that it, it is true that Adam sinned and thus affected all of his descendants. But the Orthodox never taught that all descendants are guilty of the sin of Adam and that all descendants of Adam are part of a mass damnata, a ball of damned mass. And it never affirmed the unconditional election view of Augustine. So there, there's just not statements on those things. So, so, so would you essentially say that the Orthodox position would affirm that as um, descendants of Adam, we inherit a sinful disposition, but we don't inherit the guilt of the original transgression. Correct. And, right. and then so, so the confusion lies in Western theologians, and particularly in Augustine, confusing the act of Adam's sin with the, the guilt of the sin and with the consequences of the sin. So they will typically just confuse all those and say, well, you're Adam's descendant. You're guilty. Look, you sin." Right. So, it, but those things are distinguished, right? So yes, the effects of Adam's sin bring death, decay, and corruption on his descendants, but that doesn't equate to the guilt of Adam's sin literally being parceled out to every single descendant of Adam. And that's precisely why, again, it gets more nuanced, but Orthodox Christology does not accept Augustine's Christology. Augustine has a Christology that is also not right. Now, he's not all wrong, but he, again, he's a very speculative thinker. He, he has a lot of, and he admits it too in many places, especially in on the Trinity. He says, I, you know, I'm speculating here, but this. In uh, City of God, he speculates in many places, and he, he says, um, Christ appears to me, if given my doctrine of predestination, to be a predestined man, which could be interpreted in an orthodox way, but it also can be interpreted in a Nestorian way, that Jesus is this man who was predestined to do what he did, and, but, and that sort of misses the point that he is the second person of the Godhead, which I know Augustine affirms the deity of Christ, and he affirms that it's the second person of the Godhead incarnate, but I'm pointing out an inconsistency in his theology by which he does not believe in recapitulation. So Augustine doesn't believe that Christ assumes universal human nature by which he extends his resurrection power to the entire human race. Augustine believes that there might be a sense in which Christ wills all men to be resurrected, but Christ did not assume universal human nature and thereby recapitulate and thereby extend his resurrection power to the entire cosmos. There's no cosmic scope in Augustine. And so that's why you could say that St. Maximus is very different from Augustine in terms of the meaning, mm -hmm. intention, and scope of Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and transfiguration. There's just no extending that in the cosmic scope. So the Orthodox Church went in a different direction. We believe in the cosmic scope of Christ's redemption and the recapitulation. Again, no recapitulation in Augustine at all. It's a foreign concept to him, precisely because the dominant model of his soteriology is not universal recapitulation of human nature, but the death of Christ being precisely for the predestined elect. So he's not a proponent of limited atonement, but he is a proponent of Christ's death in, intended to be only ultimately efficacious for the elect. Do you see that, that that's not limited atonement? But later, yeah. later Calvinists will take Augustine's doctrine of Christ's death being only efficacious for the fixed number of the elect and extend that to the limited atonement doctrine. Yeah. So in other words, okay, so I, Christology okay. even comes into play here. The universality of Christ. Uh, Christ is the universal man. He's the universal person. Uh, read the Manzaridis essay over at uh, Ortho Christian on Christ, the universal person. This is a crucial essay. And he's following with the uh, Athanasian uh, St. Cyril approach to Christ assuming universal human nature. This is crucial because this is how... Christ is not just linked to the elect. You can see why, oh, this is where the reformers start to get the invisible church doctrine. Well, Christ is really only united to the elect. And so, yeah, there might be a visible visible church that's out there, 
But really those letters that Paul wrote and really the message and death of Christ is only to uh, like five of the people in that church of a hundred people. So you get the invisible yeah. church doctrine. And what this, what this is missing is the universality of Christ's death and resurrection that Christ assumes universal human nature. Yeah. So in, in regard to the salvation of infants, then um, what would the orthodox position would be? Would it be that an infant doesn't have um doesn't an infant doesn't qualify for damnation until he actually engages in actual sin rather than original sin? Correct. And even the Roman Catholic view eventually states that. And I wrote a refutation of Taylor Marshall, by the way. If you want, uh, I have an essay <clears throat> where I talk about where Taylor Marshall is actually wrong on this point. And I go to Denzinger to show this, and I point out how the Vatican clarification on limbo admits all this. Even mm -hmm. they soften the view to basically say what you just said. This is why there's the limbo of infants doctrine, which, oddly enough, the Vatican document says is now optional. <laughs> I mean, that's what the document says, but it's in Denzinger. I didn't think anything in Denzinger was optional, but uh, limbo is optional now. But yes, so... I, I think we would agree that uh, there's a distinction between, you know, uh, ancestral original sin and actual sin, clearly. Um, and individual humans are not, strictly speaking, guilty until they commit actual sins. Even though they've, they've experienced the effects of Adam's sin, they're not guilty until they commit an actual sin, you know, knowingly and, and willfully. Um yeah, and so that's a, di a, a different model. And by the way, in Orthodox liturgical prayers, there's different prayers for uh, people who die outside the church. We can still pray for them. There's different prayers for unbaptized infants. And we don't make declarations. So we don't know what happens to these infants. We commend them to God in the prayers and the liturgy. And what God decides is up to God. If God has a way by which he uh, uh, grants theosis to them, we don't know. Some of the fathers speculate, but there's that's one difference on on this issue between Orthodox and Roman Catholics is that by the medieval era, the Latin scholastic tradition gets just super obsessed with trying to define every one of these areas, and the Orthodox Church is a lot more uh, amenable to saying, "Well, we, we God just simply hasn't told us. We don't know." Um, there's a there's a passage in Saint Gregory Nyssa where. Uh, he speculates, and I think Father Florovsky later comments on this, that it's possible that something like a limbo of infants is true, where they will be restored in the, rest or in, in the resurrection to some kind of blessed natural state that is not necessarily theosis that the church experiences, but we just simply aren't told. And so Orthodox is a lot more, we're okay Modest with saying we don't know, but we also don't automatically say, oh, they're all damned. We don't take that position. Yeah. And even and then, even Rome doesn't take that position anymore. And then with that in mind, then, pardon me. So, whereas Augustine would say that we ought to baptize infants because they are damned because of original sin, then would the Orthodox position be that we ought to baptize infants because um, they need to be recapitulated and their nature needs to be redeemed? And that would be more um, in tune with the doctrine of theosis and recapitulation. Well, it's that we. we everybody will, will participate in recapitulation regardless. The whole universe is going to participate in it, uh, whether you are in the church or not. But that doesn't mean that you're participating in theosis. And so we baptize infants and we do the exorcism prayers on them because they do need the life of the Holy Spirit beyond just natural life. So they do need to participate in theosis. So it is a, a real deification, but this is why there's a distinction between nature and grace we don't think they're in dialectical tension like rome does but there is a distinction between nature and supernature yeah all right yeah a lot of that makes sense and helps so there here is the essay words. that i wrote just pointing out a basic contradiction in taylor marshall on this where he was wrong um and he's even wrong in regard to what his own Vatican's uh, clarification on limbo says so there it is in the chat if you want to read that I'll post it later um, in the show description as well um, but if you want to look it up it's the essay on my website it's called Dr. Taylor Marshall refuted inherited guilt and contradictions and so I show the Roman Catholic documents their uh, evolution from Augustine on which is admitted in the Vatican clarification so 
anyway, hopefully that's helpful. But this gets into, by the way, so last week when we did this, there was a girl who asked the exact same question. And I got into it on the last week's show about Mary. And you can see how this would lead to, on their position, Immaculate Conception. Yeah. Well, thank you. Sure. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Um, I'm uh, I'm in an inquirer's class right now, and um, I've kind of been going back and forth with some of my other uh, reformed friends mm-hmm. about uh, Orthodox theology, mm-hmm. and um, uh, one one passage that's kind of um, had me thinking. I haven't heard you say anything specifically about uh, in Mark chapter nine, where um, you know the apostles rebuke the I guess, like renegade demon exerciser guys. Uh, and Jesus says, you know, whoever is not against us is for us. Um, you know, my, my reform friends kind of take that as like uh, a way to kind of refute apostolic succession. And I just was not sure. I hadn't heard anything. Well, actually, we've, uh, I've, we've, yeah, we've covered that probably, I'm not being rude, but it, that's come up probably five times in the last two years. So I've covered that on probably five different live streams. The first thing I would say is that what Jesus says there is not that, oh, he can just do whatever he wants. He says that there's nobody who uses my name that won't soon be one of us, right? So if you look in the book of Acts, I again, I've covered this in multiple live streams. If you look in the book of Acts, there are multiple, uh, I think it's like Acts 8, Acts 4. 14 and maybe 18, but there's multiple places where Paul is out on his missionary journeys and he meets um, people who had heard of Christ or only John's baptism, but didn't know about the foundation of the church. So in other words, that what your Calvinist friends are doing is taking something prior to the founding of the church, which is Pentecost in power, right? I mean, yeah, Matthew 16 is where it begins, but when he when he says that to Peter, but um, when he really empowers the church to go out is the Feast of Pentecost. And Pentecost for us is something that is a monumental point in redemptive history. And Protestants overlook this. They don't see that Pentecost is the founding of the church. So you can't take the situation in Mark where there's a guy just exercising in the time of the apostles as if that's normative for all the history of the church. I mean, there's periods where Jesus tells them to, you know, grab a sword, right? Is every pastor supposed to carry a sword around? So not everything that Jesus tells the apostles carries on into every era of the church. And that's why it takes the totality of the New Testament to look at, okay, well, when he establishes the church in Acts 2, and then when the apostles go out and they find people that are doing their own thing, what happens to them? Well, thankfully, we actually have models in the book of Acts where this occurs. And what does Paul do? He brings them under the episcopate. If they are lacking in chrismation, he chrismates them, which no Calvinist practices chrismation. If you want a full refutation of this, an example specifically, go watch the uh, reply and rebuttal that we did to Vocab Malone, the Calvinist who tried to refute us on this point. We refute uh, Vocab Malone point by point throughout the book of Acts. Um, So I'll give you the exact text where this occurs. The first one is in Acts nine i think where there's a uh, we have the mention of the bringing in of people into one visible community under the episcopate um the other one is is it 14 i think it's 14 might be 18 Here, I'll just give you the vocab Malone reputation where we go into yeah, the text. I I, dude, I guess I must have missed that part, so. Yeah, but uh, that's what I would say. And also, too, um, there are no Calvinists who do exorcism. There's no Calvinist exorcism. So the very text that they're trying to use is kind of laughable because I've never in my whole life heard of a Calvinist exorcist. So. Yeah, now, I the Orthodox it. Church <laughs> still has exorcists. And by the way, uh, if you want a fuller presentation of apostolic succession specifically, have you seen the presentation that uh, Perry Robinson did on this? No. Okay, so he has a long paper that he wrote. uh, And I'll put that in the chat right now for guys that are in the chat. 
people you can guys if you can can you share that in the discord too so there's his talk on absolute succession which goes into some of these topics too uh, let me get the re rebuttal of vocab malone where the text i'm talking about we cover in the vocab malone text because they're texts where they've only heard of john's baptism or they have not been baptized in the holy spirit aka chrismated they've only received water baptism and the apostles lay hands on them that's chrismation Right. A separate right, which no Calvinist does. This is true. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that those texts show where they don't just let everybody do whatever they want. They actually bring the kind of people, the lone, the lone wolves, they bring them under the episcopate. That's right. what That's right. what Paul does in those texts. But good questions. Yeah, thank you. AJ, I got a personal question. Um, I've been a catechumen for over a year. I've uh, successfully got off pot and psychedelics, but one thing I hold on to is booze. Uh, how were you able to get off booze? Um, let me think. Uh, probably not in the most, in the best way, uh, to be honest with you. So, let me think. When did I quit drinking? I quit drinking at about 29 or 30. I still had a few drinks into my 30s. Maybe it was more like 32 or 33. That's probably more right. Maybe 32 or 33. Because I was drinking a lot. I mean, I don't think I wasn't like a super alcoholic, but I was drinking a lot. And I just decided that uh, I wanted to, number one, I wanted to do be more productive in what I do, my work, my job. Uh, I was blogging at the time. I wasn't, I was starting to do kind of the stuff that I do now. Uh, and I just realized how much time and money I wasted on booze and I had severe gut issues. Can't to the extent like Michaela Peterson level gut issues. So I just realized I cannot drink alcohol. It just, it will not work for me. Uh, and so for me that number one, the, the gut issues was a big part of why I didn't do it. I don't believe that it's wrong for people to drink. Uh, if people can do it in moderation. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But for me, uh, it was so severe that like I can't drink at all. It just messes my gut up for like two weeks if I do. Um, I do take communion, by the way, um, which it, that doesn't bother me. But let me think what I... So w I woke up one day when I decided, I kind of like woke up in the in early in the morning. I was like, I'm going to stop drinking. I'm just done with it. I'm tired of it. And for... I mean, I wasn't... Again, I didn't get like shakes. But what I did do was find another thing to replace it. That's actually when I started smoking. So I don't recommend this, but it did work <laughs> in a roundabout way for me. I started smoking cigarettes uh, for the next probably four or five years. I smoked American spirits pretty regularly. Um, you got people can find old live streams of videos of me where I'm smoking cigarettes. I think if you find that old Donnie Darko video I did, which was one of my first videos like 11 years ago on YouTube, where I'm wearing a tie. <laughs> I'm sitting there in my library de deconstructing. I'm like, I'm smoking American spirits and talking about Donnie Darko. But that was right around the time I decided to quit drinking. And I, it, the, the cigarettes were a replacement. And then, and I don't recommend doing this, but it, it did work. It just shifted the focus to a different drug. And then what happened was I got pneumonia from smoking cigarettes all the time when I started traveling to do some shows and I never had pneumonia. I did, I just thought, Oh, that's something like old people get. And you know, it's what you got a cold. Okay. Sorry, dude. No, dude. Pneumonia can be like, like you feel like you're dying. So I got pneumonia once and that was a huge kick in the butt to inspire me to stop smoking, but I didn't, I kept smoking. So I smoked cigarettes and then I vaped and I got pneumonia again and it was just as bad and it was so bad that i was like i'm never gonna vape again if because i went to the to the uh clinic and they had to give me an antibiotic shot it was so bad because i thought i was gonna die like i had like 105 fever for five days it wouldn't go away and so when i got the antibiotic shot she was like if you keep vaping and smoking, I can guarantee you that you will get pneumonia again. And it was so bad that that was enough. So I was just like, I'm done. And I'll tell you what, it was 
two weeks of no vaping and smoking cigarettes was harder than the non-alcohol because your body like really reacts to mine did everybody's body's different but not having tobacco like really messed up my digestion and it messed up my like i felt like i had a, the flu again this is after i was already healed from pneumonia then i wasn't smoking and it felt like the worst flu for like two weeks it was horrible and it messed up my gut and then i was like i'm, I'm never doing this and that i just never i never craved a cigarette again so it actually took two pneumonias to make me never crave a cigarette and it was cigarettes that helped me never crave alcohol and then i just made it a strict thing where uh i literally don't remember the last time i had a drink it's probably been th- three maybe four years since i've had a single drop of alcohol i don't miss it at all i can't stand alcohol now i don't have any problem with it. i'm not judging anybody i just personally hate alcohol <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how else to say it i hate it um i wish that i could be you know like when i was 22 and it was fun to have a glass of wine if i have a glass of wine dude it messes up my digestion so bad that it's just painful for like a week or two and all my friends, you know, everybody still drinks and I, I, I'm not, I don't judge them. I'm not mad at anybody, but anyway, so I, I can't recommend to you my method of quitting alcohol because it leads you to getting pneumonia twice and feeling like you're going to die. Uh, but anyway, that's pretty much how it happened for me. It was a really weird roundabout way, but I'm glad I didn't keep drinking. I mean, I think one thing I noticed was that I was a lot more productive immediately and i think i don't think i could be where i'm at i mean there's a lot of things obviously but one of the reasons that we've had success and so much output is precisely because i don't drink because i remember when i would drink i would get tired and i go to sleep earlier and you just kind of get lazy and you just don't oh, i'll do it later and so i was able to basically you know multiply my productive capabilities two three x by just totally giving up alcohol and i that's I don't miss it one bit. So, um, I'll tell you this. So it also depends on your age group and it depends on what your friends do. So if you have a lot of friends that are young and they still go out to the bars and they still go out drinking, I mean, I'm at the age now, all my friends are kids, they have kids. So nobody goes out the bars anymore. So as you get older, it gets easier because people aren't drinking. Um, if you go to parties, yeah, like, you know, get togethers at friends house, then people are drinking. I, I have literally have no desire to drink at all. And it just, it's weird because I used to love it. And then now it's a thing where even if my friends who I will tolerate and be around and family members, they, get, they just, they really get on my nerves when they drink, but I love them and I tolerate them. And I, when we hang out, we still do it. But anyway, I'm rambling, but I don't know if that, I don't know if that's helpful. Maybe that's bad advice, but yeah, that's, that's helpful. How about this? I have, um, the daily coming in and the Toncat in hopes to quit, you know, drinking booze every time I take an exam or something, you know. Are you like young and in college? Yeah, I'm heading out. I'm 30 now, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm about to finish. Well, you're, so you're at now. about the point where I quit. So here, the main driver for me to quit was I decided that I wanted to not be a wage slave. I wanted to... Uh, be in charge of my life and my own boss. And I, and I realized that I was going to have to like focus my time and energy into what I did to do that. And I just said, you know what? I am totally willing to give up alcohol to achieve that end. And I really think that a lot of people don't achieve what they could precisely because they drink. I had another friend, one of my good friends just died by the way. Uh, we did his funeral about a month ago and he drank himself to death. And I tried for years and years to get him to stop. Um, I've had people in my family with drinking problems. That's another, imp- that's another big kick in the butt is that if you have family members with serious drinking problems, if you don't drink and you, sh- and you become a, a, an example to them, not, I'm not talking about teetotaler moral crap. Okay. Well, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, be an example of what you can accomplish if you don't drink. Like start a business, get into Bitcoin, trading Bitcoin, you know, learning these things, 
learning to do videos, learning to live stream, learning to do the things that you see me doing, write a book. I wouldn't have done any of this stuff if I'd been drinking this whole time. So reorient your mindset to be like, oh, I want to actually accomplish some shit. That's not an attack on you. I'm not saying you're not accomplishing things. I'm just saying that I was a constantly drinking grad student guy, unhappy. And I was like, dude, this is, what am I doing? Alcohol is just a total waste of time and money. Plus I was broke. So I was like constantly buying these just shitty, cheap drinks, you know? Like, why am I drinking 40s? These are disgusting. <laughs> it's because I was broke, right? I was a broke grad student buying 40s and shit. And it's just like, all right, I'm done. I'm out of this. And my whole life changed. I can't guarantee you that your life will change if you stop drinking. But uh, I recommend it if you want to become successful. And again, it's not, an, uh, it's not a um, foolproof thing. But it's one of the steps that you can take if you want to do it. By the way, you look back at me when I when I first live stream or or even uh, was doing videos like ten years ago. Go look at my first ten my first video. It's pretty hilarious. But I'm like this carb beer bloated uh, dude wearing a wearing a tie and smoking my American spirits, and I was half drunk in that analysis because I was nervous. I was like, I'm gonna have to drink. Is that one thing I realized too? Is that it, it, it was not good to rely on alcohol to do live streams and to do videos and do this kind of stuff. I will admit there were times when alcohol could, could inspire you to maybe write good. Because when I was writing 10, 11 years ago, I was still drinking. So I could probably write some neat things or decent things when I was drinking. But once your gut, after you get age 30, dude, like you're, it hurts your body and it just messes you up. It's just not worth it. It's not worth it. And if you're in a, but if you're the kind, it's again, it depends on the person. Some people can like drink one drink a week and it's nothing to them. But like some people have addictive personalities and they will just, and I'm that kind of a person. I will go from drinking every day to I'm totally done. I hate this. And then now I smoke cigarettes every day. Right. And then I had to get pneumonia twice. All right, I'm done with cigarettes. And that, that worked, but it sucked, dude. I had to literally had to get pneumonia twice which was a nightmare. It feels like you're dying. Uh, but that's what it took to, you know, kind of like kick my butt to stop smoking and it worked. And, and now, by the way, there's some truth to the claim, you know, when you, if you have addictions to these kinds of things, once you get past like, what do they say? 40 days. When you get over the 40 day hump, it's a lot easier. Not perfect, but it's easier. And then when you get past like, Four, three, four years of no alcohol. Like, I, there's no temptation for me to drink alcohol. I'm just like, ugh. When I smell alcohol now, especially like vodka or whiskey, it makes me want to throw up. It's weird. It's weird because I used to drink, like I would finish off a fifth of tequila in a weekend. Like, we, I'd drink that in a day, no problem. My buddies and I, we'd finish off a fifth, or even a, a gallon of tequila in a weekend, maybe. Like, we'd, I'd drink the crap out of tequila, dude. I would drink bottles of scotch, like, in no time. Fill the glass up of scotch, right? Like, fill it up to here and then put, like, that much water. <laughs> Just sip on that all night. And, like, now when I smell scotch or I smell, especially vodka, dude. Vodka, oh, man. Or gin. I mean, I immediately want to throw up. Any alcohol. So, it depends on what you want. If you want it, you can have it. If you watch your dreams, you can, I feel like a motivational speaker, like some kind of like a Tony Robbins kind of guy. Like if you stop drinking, you can walk across this mile of hot coals. I promise you like Tony Robbins style. Uh, anyway, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's all I can say. I got a question, Jay. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you ever found anything that works for like ADHD symptoms other than those uh, amphetamines they give you or nicotine or whatever? Cause I think I'm addicted to nicotine because of that like ADHD type stuff, but do you know of anything natural that, um, that helps with that other than the amphetamines? I don't, kind of I, I, I don't, I mean, doctor. uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I wish I could help you. Like my, my issue was never attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So I, I don't know. I wish I could tell you about that. I, it's, it's all I know is like my own weird spurgy issues that I had, which was never that it was always like, uh, 
just like weird gut issues. And then when you, you know, you learn about the gut affecting the brain and all that. So I think some of my problems in, the, in my twenties, like I, I had, you know, kind of upsetting emotional types of issues in my twenties precisely because I was drinking all the time. I didn't know anything about gut issues. My gut was all messed up. And then when I healed my gut, a lot of my imbalanced uh, personal issues calmed down too. So one thing I would say is try the keto carnivore diet because your gut has a huge influence on your brain and your emotions. But I'm not a health person. You could go talk to Tristan. Tristan will probably know better about that than me. And of course, we do recommend chalk.com if people want to, you know, look at supplements that have helped me. So what I when I got one thing that a person who d- does addiction counseling told me that was helpful, what and this is the Orthodox priest, he said what the thing that ha- that helps people that are addictive in their personalities and all of us are addicted to some degree because sin itself is a kind of an addiction right but uh is to replace it with something else that consumes your time now ultimately we would want this to be god but not everybody can immediately jump into being totally consumed by god sometimes we have to replace addictions for example with healthy hobbies maybe uh, you know, if I'm sitting around on my computer all day, if I'm tempted with porn, maybe the healthy uh, uh, hobby that you adopt is, okay, I'm going to start lifting weights and I'm going to start doing physical activities, right? Rather than just sitting around playing on the computer all day. So you adopt a healthy activity to replace the, the vice or the one that's unhealthy. So those kinds of things can be very helpful um, for various vices or addictions and, and probably the same for uh, alcohol, gambling, that kind of stuff too, where you uh, replace it with a new thing that you've gotten into. So for me, it was, I wanted to be my own boss. I wanted to do media. I wanted to do what I wanted to do without being a slave to the university and to these you know bitchy managers who didn't know anything bossing me around all day. I want to be my own boss, right? So that was a huge impetus to uh, do what I do now. And it worked. And I'm glad I did. But again, I had to replace all this time and effort and energy and money that I'm putting into stupid beer and tequila and scotch every week and redirect that time and focus and energy and just get obsessed in a new way to something that's healthy. I don't mean that literally obsessed. You know what I mean? Like all the time and energy and attention that you put into the vice, you got to find a new thing that is healthy to put your time and energy into now ultimately yes it's god but not everybody can just immediately be a monastic right so we sometimes have healthy outlets lifting weights exercising taking on new activities whatever they may be i don't know pick your your healthy activities playing an instrument i don't know but uh that is one approach is to move on to something new and eventually the addictive desire subsides and goes away. Now it may not totally go away. It might come back at different times, but like I said, for me, zero desire for alcohol, zero desire for cigarettes after four years. We'll say none at all. Nice. Thank you. That's, that's helpful of us. And I want to remind it. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I had better advice, uh, but everybody who, um, is in our chat if you want to support my show uh, and you want to know, well, how do you focus so well? How do you constantly put out all this content? Well, yes, part of it is that I quit drinking four years ago, but I also got into uh, supplements that are nootropic, supplements that help brain activity, and that would be things like uh, Sheila Jet, for example, which is great for mental clarity, and that's chalk.com. You can go to the link below, uh, chalk.com, and you get 60% off still. Um, they're a great, awesome, based company. Uh, we love those guys. They are anti-Big Soy. They're fighting Big Soy in a big way. And if you put in the promo code J60, that's J-A-Y-6-0, at chalk.com, you get 60% off. And he's also, our good bro over there, has stacked the chalk supplements in different categories. So maybe you're looking for stuff that's amenable to the ladies. You don't want to be looking like, as a lady the creatures in the Michelangelo Sistine Chapel paintings. You don't want gigantic, like buff. You don't want to be buffer than your husband, right? But you want to be mental clarity and you want to be fit 
and you want to be emotionally stable, then you want chalk.com. Dudes, maybe you want to look like the men and the women <laughs> in Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel because all of those women are freaking buff, dude. Those women are buffer than me, and that's because Michelangelo had male models for the women. I, that's all weird. But uh, also, if you want to be a gigantic buff for action hero, I recommend the Tomcat 100. Big fan of that one. Um, action 2.0, if you're looking for energy. Uh, as we said, the Sheila Jit for mental clarity. If you're looking for that, like overall replacement for the nutrients that are missing in a lot of our diets, I recommend the daily. Uh, but again, you get 60% off. Everything that they do is completely organic. It's rainforest sourced 100%. Uh, very, very, uh, as we said, patriotic red pill based guys over there at chalk.com. So that's why we have to remember to support corp corporations and companies on our side. That's a huge part of fighting this goofy system is not putting the money into Jeffrey Bezos, not putting the money into Guild Aids, not putting the money into all of these Fortune 100 demon companies. Put your money in the companies that are on our side. That's a crucial way because this system sucks all of everybody's energy and money as they put out all of this like toxic, just destructive food, culture, art, etc. So, oh, it's it's huge, huge, huge if you can support companies and guys on our side. So, again, their their material shown in paper in in multiple peer review papers to boost testosterone, especially the Tomcat. Uh, it, they got banned from Instagram for being too based, too red pill. So you know they're good guys. Uh, it's just they're a great company. They're anti big soy, and the products work. And I've been using them for months now, and yeah, everybody's like, well, what's your secret? How do you have so much energy? How do you put so much content? Chalk.com, dude. And I don't drink. <laughs> but let's move on. Who's next? Nobody's hey, next. Added... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, you uh, had... I was going to ask, uh, what would some of the metaphysical consequences be for someone who rejects the essence energy distinction? I have a couple friends who are into like Far Eastern thought, and they have this idea that the world can't be distinct from God because that would be in a way saying that something's outside of God, limiting God's power. Therefore, God is not absolute. What was your response to that? Be? Well, I'll tell you one metaphysical consequence. Hell, have you ever thought about that? No, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, typically. So the first metaphysical consequence of pantheism would be monism. Um, if everything is God, then it immediately becomes problematic to see how things are distinct. I mean, for in other words, any monistic position which says that fundamental reality is all one thing then has to grapple with, well, but it seems like in our experience and when we talk and when we communicate and when we think, we distinguish things, right? I mean, I'm not you. This thing is not that thing. So what are the distinctions then? And then most of the time, those pantheistic worldviews opt towards, oh, it's an illusion, bro. So typically, a monistic position is going to fall into a reality is illusion, Maya type of view. Not always. Sometimes they might say, well, God has different levels of, of reality, which is problematic because, well, now, wait a minute. So how are there different levels to God? And if, if there's different levels to God, uh, then wouldn't there be different gods, you see? Because now we've compromised the idea of divine simplicity. We're saying that, well, there is one God, but there's all these levels of reality that are... And so there's just different... And, that, and then monism might also fall over into dualism, a person who believes that all reality is God or is one thing would then have to distinguish, well, does that mean that you or your mind is literally the same as physical reality? And if so, maybe why do they seem to be opposites, right? So again, the, the fundamental problems that Plato has are going to be the same types of problems that monistic and dualistic systems have. So typically uh, think about Descartes. Descartes looking for the ultimate uh, foundation for his strong foundationalism. And he thinks his solution is a body soul, a, a body soul dualism, a mind world dualism. But the problem then is, well, how do you relate to fundamentally opposite things, ideas and physical reality, mind and body, because they're explained and defined as opposites. You see, so typically any uh, monistic position, any absolute divine simplicity position, any 
all is one position will collapse into the fundamental problems of monism and dualism. And it's just a repeat that it's always the same. It's always the same because you're limited. These positions are very limited in the ways that they can go. There's, there's, there's not an infinite number of worldviews. There's a few worldviews that have starting points that they're limited in that had then have infinite variations down the road, down the line, but not in the basic starting points you see. Yeah, I think Bonten also said something similar as to like if you're arguing with a Hindu, uh, if they took a monistic position, like then their argument doesn't make sense be- sense because there would be no difference between my argument and their argument. Exactly, there would be nothing to refute. Yeah, there's a great quote in Van Til uh, where he says, "If you believe that all reality is one, then." you would have to explain how you're coming to realize that all reality is one is somehow distinct from the one because you're saying that I learned that all reality is the one. Well, who are you? Are you, you're, but you're also the one Then how did you come to discover some new state of affairs if all reality is one? So in other words, there would be, a, it's still relying on distinctions, which the position denies. And likewise, if you were to say that all reality is an illusion, another variation of that, then your coming to realize that is also within the illusion. So it's self-refuting. Right. And you can only say something's an illusion if like that presupposes you have something access to something outside of. Yeah. You would have to have, you have a, a basis to make the, uh, the judgment of illusion versus reality. Yeah. Some type of benchmark. Uh, changing standard. Yeah. Criteria. Right. Truth. By the way, the same follows the same sort of kind of argument to, um, so, that it's self-defeating with uh, determinism. Mm -hmm. Now, for some reason, people find that harder to grasp why determinism is a defeater for knowledge. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure why the the psychology of, but as I always say, if if everything's determined, um, nothing's truth directed, let alone he doesn't even get off the ground to justification, right? I mean, do you say that rocks and trees are truth directed? That they, they have, you know, truth directed is uh, has kind of aboutness and intentionality. But if everything is determined, then it's very much like rocks and trees. There's, there's nothing true or false about it, right? It doesn't rise to that level, let alone. Justification is the notion of uh, having sufficient and good reasons to hold a true belief. Mm -hmm. But if your ultimate principle is that behind everything is determinism, well, that determines belief A and not A in exactly the same way. So two things that that shows... Well, if that's your ultimate principle, then the very notion of truth and falsehood just disintegrates. And second of all, if everything's determined, is that a good reason to hold whatever belief that you have? So it ends up, in other words, how is it so, let me put it easier. How is it self-defeating? Your belief that determinism is true is just as determined as the belief that it's false. And it's just as valid. Why? What's the? What's your principle of validity? Determinism. So, why are you arguing with the person that's saying determinism's false? They're just determined. <laughs> Do you see how it ends up being self-defeating? Well, yeah. There's no reason to believe it if you can't reason about it. Like, there's, you lack the ability to reason it properly because you're determined to reason it in a certain way. Yeah. Well, yeah, you won't know if it's proper. And I don't think anybody that thought about it thinks that being determined is a good reason to hold a belief. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but that's the notion of what justification is. Yeah. Yeah, it really removes any real meaning to true and false. So. No, it's, yeah. Um, we got a couple super uh, super chats here, and we'll go back to the Discord. Popa Swag says for five dollars. Do you have videos about the topic of KGV onlyism and its proponents? Uh, I do not. That's not really. I don't. Have, I don't even remember if it's ever come up. Uh, oddly, but 
I mean, really, it's just kind of a mm, cultic type of position based on just fundamental ignorance of the history of the church and the early church and, and how we got the canon. So really, any treatment of the canon, even from Protestants and its formation, maybe F.F. F. Bruce's book, uh, Canon of Scripture, or Lee McDonald's book, Formation of the Canon, would kind of show you why uh, a strict KGV-only Baptist type of view is just kind of really childish. I mean, first of all, the original KJV had the Deuterocanon. It had the, the it has the Apocrypha in it. So I don't know of any KJV only who actually believe the Apocrypha. So that's one oddity. Um, I don't know why anybody thinks that the King of England is supposedly the authority for what English speaking people are supposed to read in terms of the Bible. Uh, the King of England has no authority in the church whatsoever. So uh, all of these sort of presuppositions behind KJV onlyism are, are really kind of uh, preposterous, and I think it's kind of like a Protestant version of Islam, where they're looking for a perfect text, like Muslims think the Quran is, and that's just we're not a uh, we're, we're not Muslims. We don't believe that there is this perfect book that is God's only revelation to man. Uh, Jesus says, you search the scriptures because you think that it is in them that you have eternal life. When is they that bear witness of me? And so it's not a, we're in a totally different paradigm here where we're not looking for um, a book. We're looking for the person of Christ. Yes, he's revealed in the book. Yes, I believe in inerrancy and inspiration, but I don't believe in Sola Scriptura. So when Sola Scriptura falls away, Things like King James only King James onlyism will fall away as well. Cody Bruce, ten dollars. Thank you for the content. I enjoy it. Thank you, Cody Bruce. Much appreciated. Five dollars, uh, Justy Busty. <laughs> uh, it must have been looking at the men uh, in the Michelangelo painting. Actually, they weren't busty. Well, the, one of the Sybils was extremely busty, which was bizarre. But the men who were the models for the women were ironically not busty. It's like they had giant men pecs and then like this little extension. Of a lemon it's very weird do you know any church fathers that deal with the objection that the logos is just the plan or the reason in god's mind in john one well it sounds like it would be amenable to like a jehovah's witness or a uh, uh an arian type of argument so i don't recall the top of my head if there's that specific argument because John 1 is identifying the plan in God's mind with the person of the Logos. So the person of the Logos manifests the plan of the Father into reality. So it's not that he's merely a, a, a mind or a mental reality. It's that the common mind of the Trinity is uniquely manifested from the Father through the Son and in the Spirit. So the Son has a unique role as the agent of creation that the father speaks through right the father's word is is the logos manifested but he's also that second person of the godhead so um yeah that's a little ambiguous uh, i'm not trying to avoid it it's just uh I, I don't i've not ever heard that but it sounds arian and many of the of the church fathers especially athanasius uh, definitely goes into refuting those kinds of arguments Coom pod janitor ten dollars yikes that, that does not sound like a good job although there probably will be uh many of our jobs in the future there will there'll be no jobs except you can be a coom pod janitor ten dollars maybe the song everyone has aids from team america is predictive programming <laughs> uh could be but i don't it's been a long time since i've seen team america uh it's pretty funny but um i don't know there's a something something's ability to destroy the immune system yes i do think the stabbies do that elc shout out to uh discord member elc 25 dollars. he says believing that the russians have an evil plan to take over the orthodox church is a conspiracy theory but don't tell the boomers and liberal docs that well that's the thing is that there's approved conspiracy theories so russia gate donald trump that was an approved system promoted conspiracy theory. that's a conspiracy theory that you're supposed to have uh, the, Russian, the, the entire Orthodox Church is a big KGB conspiracy. You're supposed to have that conspiracy. Um, but then at the same time, conspiracies don't exist. They're not real. Stephen DeLay, $10. Perhaps you've addressed this already. 
in your work, but what are your thoughts on <laughs> Alexander Hislop's Two Babylons? Uh, it's a classic example of uh, misinterpreting signs and symbols, thinking that signs and symbols only have one meaning and one referent, um, concluding that because there's similarity between various symbols that they mean the same thing, they have a malicious intent, which is just really uh, naive and, and silly. I mean, it's, it's kind of a version of word concept fallacy, but with symbols. So, for example, oh, the Pope has a hat that looks like uh, Pharaoh's hat. Because there's no historical connection between those at all. At all. Like, the bishop's mitre that Western bishops wear has nothing to do with Pharaoh. And the easiest way to disprove this is just that context and intention determine the meaning of symbols. Not just the usage of the symbol. Not just a word. For example... The bright and morning star. Who is that? Oh, it's Jesus and it's Lucifer. So Masons conclude that Jesus and Lucifer are the same. No, it's ridiculous. It's a symbol being used in two different ways, two different senses for two different reference. In one sense, it's like Christ in that it's like a bright star rising like a resurrection. But in another sense, it's like Lucifer falling, right? Lucifer, the son of the morning. The lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus. Satan goes around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. So the lion, in one sense, is a referent, it has a referent to Satan, and in one sense, it has a referent to Christ. Would we conclude with Charles Manson that Jesus and the devil are the same as a result of that? Well, some people do because they're stupid. So that's another example of most of the presuppositions and misunderstandings in his lops to Babylon's. As an aside, the New York Times published an interview with Dave Chalmers. Uh, there's lots of VR simulation theory propaganda in it. Okay. Um, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know who that is. Uh, I'm assuming that's somebody that relates to simulation theory, VR theory. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's what we tried to cover in that live stream a week or two ago where we're just trying to look at. I mean, look, a lot of this is just rehashed ancient Hindu stuff. <laughs> so ancient Gnostic Hindu stuff being rehashed is not some new discovery. Creation X Nilo, five, $5. Some rabbis think that Meroz is a planet inhabited by heavenly beings. What are your thoughts on the possibility of these uh, see Judges 520, 523? Yeah, well, I think there's angels. So I think that a lot of the texts that uh, mystical rabbinical Judaism speculates on is applying to is applying some of those texts to that that I think are talking about heavenly beings or sons of God or angels, uh, Nephilim type texts, right? That's what I think it's talking about. Um, could God have a being on another planet? Yeah, but I don't see any evidence or reason to think so. So that's my position. Sh Simeon M, ten dollars related to ancestral sin. In contrast to the Immaculate Conception, how do you uh, explain the Orthodox position to Protestants who deny the possibility of Mary being personally sinless? Well, it doesn't... So, because she can be graced such that even though she's born as a son of Adam, like Mary, she doesn't sin. So the fact that a person is a creature... And even if they're born as a descendant of Adam, it's all the more a testament, testament to the grace of the, that the Theotokos received that in her life she was the spotless virgin and didn't sin. So actually the Orthodox position is the one that, number one, contrary to the Roman Catholic position, actually gives a high position to Mary, at, given that she's even a son of Adam, because she, hello, Dormition, Feast of Dormition, she went to sleep. She died. Okay, sons of Adam die. So anyway, it's I, I really think that's not that complex. Um, it's the Augustinian view of original sin that led people to think that there had to be the Immaculate Conception doctrine. Uh, if the Augustinian doctrine of Immaculate Conception or, uh, of original sin is not true, then we don't have to believe in the Immaculate Conception view of the Roman Catholic Church, and yet we can still affirm that she's a spotless virgin that did not commit actual sin, and she's still a descendant of Adam because she went to sleep, i.e. she died. And even the Uniates have the Feast of the Dormition. 
And when you ask Roman Catholics why, they say, oh, she willed to die just to be more united to her son. So they just have a cope and a uh, ad hoc rescue. Palantir, $5, $3. Uh I have a question regarding Old Testament prophecies. Are there passages indicating the Messiah would have two comings? Yes, I think that, well, by virtue of the fact that he brings peace, dies. We've talked about texts that talk about him him dying on the third day in the debate with Paul Williams. Is that that Amos or Hosea? Uh, We've all of the Psalms that talk about him cutting, being cut off. But at the same time, all the predictions and just the Psalms. So throughout the Psalms, there are so many Messianic prophecies that his death, burial, his life, teachings, death, burial, resurrection, even the Eucharist, the founding of the church, all of that is in the Psalms. All that's in Isaiah. And the resurrection and the ascension. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. And the church, the Gentile, all the dozens of passages of the church. So in other words, I'm saying, yes, uh, implicitly, the whole of the Old Testament is just constantly talking about implicitly two comings. And the second coming, if you listen to Cabane, Cabane is correct to point out that the second coming isn't technically a second coming. It's like the first advent is the totality of the eschaton invading the here and the now. So Jesus is coming at his first advent and he constantly comes in judgment in the history of the church and his second coming is one coming. That's the atemporal already not yet view of scripture. But good question. J Mel Uh, $30. What do you think about Jack Donovan's book, Way of Men? Or is there any need for mentioning it in general? Fantastic talk today. Um, So I do not follow Jack Donovan. I know that Jack Donovan has chosen a kind of lifestyle, obviously, as a kind of a neo-pagan and whatnot that is not the orthodox lifestyle. Uh, I've not read his book. I have heard a few interviews of him. Um, But I just don't think that we as orthodox need uh neo-pagan ideas so um that's all i can say on that but i appreciate your donation um that i mean that doesn't mean that i'm saying that everything that the manosphere talks about is bad or wrong it's just that the liberal areas of what's in orthodoxy or professes to be orthodox that doesn't mean that we have to run to uh kind of neo-pagan ideas to recover masculinity i think that the fact that we have all these warrior saints should point out that we, that orthodoxy fundamentally is masculine. The fact that we have warrior saints shows that we're not C U C K E D. Uh, we're not pacifists. Okay. So the reason I think a lot of Christians turn to that stuff is precisely because of much of cuckianity is precisely that. And they see, skittles everywhere and so they think all right i guess that's time to run to pay but guess what uh a lot of pagan stuff has skittles <laughs> newsflash um all right anybody else in discord i had a question jay if you don't mind sure uh i had a question about tag uh, you had mentioned earlier that we can use the classical arguments for god's existence in a tag way mm-hmm. such as the cosmological argument and the teleological argument etc mm-hmm. could you explain how that can be done yeah, it's just like taking um, anything that is necessary for knowledge, like universals, abstract entities, or you can take cause, cause, uh, causation or, or teleology as examples of things that are necessary for the possibility of knowledge. So in other words, uh, if causation isn't the case, you can't have knowledge of the external world. That would be a transcendental version of the cosmological uh, principle. If there is no teleology, knowledge is not possible. That is different from saying, let's just neutrally all look at the world and we all recognize and know that there is this thing called teleology and maybe we can find a generic monad behind that. That's two totally different approaches. 
I see. Uh, I also wanted to ask you about uh, messianic prophecies. Uh, isn't you know you're doing doing apologetics based on messianic prophecies? Uh, isn't that evidentialism? So how does that fit in with presuppositionalism? Right? So presuppositionalism is not opposed to evidences. Evidentialism is a different approach of epistemology, whereby it's assumed that the unbeliever is in a position to judge God and to judge and interpret the evidences when we're not challenging his presuppositions. So the problem is not evidences, because we believe there's nothing but evidence. The presuppositional approach is literally that the pencil here on my desk, I can use this to prove the Trinity. The principles of the universe all point to the Trinity. They point to Christ. The resurrection, all of these, there's nothing wrong with evidences. Evidentialism is a different thing. So, of course, we have to do evidential presentations and refutations and arguments. Evidences are a crucial, huge part of the apologetic, and the tag argument itself is an evidence. But that's yeah, not... Jay, I think that you saw this in the Trump debate. Yeah. I imagine I'll see you with Ashrar on this Saturday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that they believe that our position is a denial of using reason and evidence. And that presupposition means just turn off the, the mind and you've got to presuppose the faith. But as you point out, that's that's not the case. Yeah, let's let's be clear here. So people hear the words and they think that it necessitates or, or means the acceptance of a position. If I make an argument from ideas, it doesn't mean I'm not an idealist. If I make an argument uh, uh, from empirical sense data, it doesn't mean I'm an empiricist in, in the sense of the school of philosophy. If I use evidences in my apologetic, which everybody does, it does not follow from that that I'm an evidentialist in my epistemology and methodology. I see. So, um, in which case, how can you know messianic prophecies can be effective against, for example, atheists, because you know they can just you know explain away. Well, that's why you have to do both, right? So it's not an either or, like I either do presup or I use evidences. Again, it's, it's, a it's a both and. And so, for example, if I'm presenting my case for, let's say an atheist says, well, I don't believe in inspiration. I have a twofold approach that I'm going to do. I'm going to say on the one hand, well, no, wait a minute. Uh, I'll tell you why I believe in inspiration and give you the case for it. And it's because there are these prophecies and they predict events. And, the, you know, so my story, my narrative makes sense. And evidences and messianic prophecies are part of my overall story. And then when I challenge the atheists, I say, it's not a battle of competing evidences. Like you have your atheist evidences and I have my Christian evidences and we'll put them on the scale and see. No, it's two totality stories. Part of the story of which is evidences. Now you give your story, and not only do I think you can't account for evidences, I don't think you can account for anything. So basically, evidences are part of my totality story, which I'm telling the story that is the precept story, that is the tag story, that is the Orthodox Christian paradigm, and I'm comparing that to his story, which is the atheist paradigm, the atheist story, the atheist attempt to account for knowledge and for evidences. So it's a battle of worldviews and evidences, quote unquote, are just a piece of those two stories. I see. Thanks, Jay. That clears up a lot. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, if, if an atheist says, uh, if an atheist says something like, uh, there's no reason to believe it, that the Bible is uh, accurate and that it predicts anything. Can somebody mute? That's loud. Well, that's a great place to say, well, hold on, wait a minute. Um, there are many places where the Bible is actually confirmed in terms of archaeology. So number one, the, the statements you made are false. Here's a bunch of Messianic prophecies that point to Christ. Those things rebut the claim that you made. However, my apologetic is not going to stop there, and that doesn't make me an evidentialist. Because I'm going to take it to the next level and say, really, at what's What's at dispute between me and you, Mr. Atheist, is not pieces of data. It's worldviews that contextualize and interpret the pieces of data. That's where I'm going to take the debate to have a much more efficacious and authentic debate and powerful debate, rather than arguing with him over interpretation of the minutiae and the pieces of data. 
So you're correct that if my argument was, well, I think there's a lot of good ideas and reasons to believe that a resurrection could have happened. That's a terrible argument. My, that's not the argument I'm saying. The argument I'm saying is that the resurrection is a fact because it's in revelation and revelation gives me the worldview that makes knowledge possible. Now you make sense of knowledge at all and evidences at all. And you can't do that. So it's a much stronger argument, but it doesn't mean there's no evidences or we don't use evidences. We absolutely do. Thanks, Jay. Sure. Uh, Alan Coleman, $5. I've enjoyed this content and I'm learning a lot about the Trinity since I left oneness Pentecostalism. Oh, that's good. Good to hear. Can you offer a refutation to the Jesus name only baptism? Well, the easiest refutation is that Matthew 28 says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I know that the oneness Pentecostals say, yeah, that name is just Jesus. And uh, uh, the text that you just mentioned in Acts 19 is not rebaptism; It's baptism into Christ's baptism that he gave the apostles in the church at Pentecost. So if they've only heard of John's baptism, then what's happening in Acts 19 is being baptized into the Trinity and or being brought under the Episcopate. So again, go listen to the refutation of Vocab Malone, where we go through those texts where that's chrismation. So what these Pentecostal crazy people don't realize is that they're not doing gibberish. They're doing chrismation, anointing with oil, which is a ritual that the Orthodox Church does that none of the Protestants do. That's what's going on in Acts 19 and these other texts. It's not uh, gibberish. Okay, in Acts 2, it's not gibberish. It's known languages as a sign, not babbling. So, yeah, uh, before worrying about that, though, if you just study the Trinitarian theology, all of that stuff will, will work itself out. So learn the Trinity theology first, and don't even worry about arguing this goofy oneness stuff. Kane London, $5. Is there any anti-Kabbalist book from early church fathers or Orthodox theologians. Well, the Kabbalism was not a, uh, an operant normative philosophy in the uh, patristic period. So Kabbalism becomes uh, popular in rabbinical uh, Judaism in the Middle Ages. So this is, uh, oh, what's that guy's name? Like the Isaac Luria. These, these are like uh, medieval and Spanish rabbis you know, in the Middle Ages and in the early modern period. So, no, you're not going to find uh, refutations of Kabbalism because there wasn't really Kabbalism necessarily as a school yet, although there were, there was a mystical side to Judaism, sure. I mean, Kabbalists, quote-unquote, will refer to Ezekiel and the chariot uh, theology of Ezekiel, which we think is just Christ's chariot. The, ser- the cherubim are the... the, the chariot upon which one like the son of man rides who is the word of god in ezekiel 1 to 10 go watch my whole video on ezekiel 1 to 10 talking obviously about christ um but the closest thing to what you're asking would be uh patristic refutations of either neoplatonism or originism because kabbalism is largely kind of an amalgamation of different gnostic systems and neoplatonic systems so all the church fathers that refute neoplatonism uh cappadocians do um Maximus does in the Ambigua that functions basically as a reputation of the Kabbalist agnostic systems as well. Uh, and then, of course, the church fathers that refute Marcion by extension could be applied to that. Where can I find part two of your talk with uh, a certain person? Um, there isn't. It's not posted. But thank you for asking that. Bing Bong 490. Do classical liberals conflict with Christian faith? Uh, yes, I had many critiques of classical liberalism. You could go look at the critique I did of Jordan Peterson four years ago, three years ago, four years ago. Um, had a lot of views, and that is a critique of classical liberalism. And I critique it from the vantage point of how it just really makes no sense <laughs> with uh, Orthodox Christian philosophy or theology. Um, what is the way to organize society according to the Christian faith? Uh, I have many old talks on that. Go listen to all the old talks I, I do when I talked about the Orthodox conception of church and state. We did probably did 10 of those talks four years ago, three years ago. So I would just say go look at those. Bayes Michigander, 
Um, would you debate Rabbi Tobia Singer? Uh, sure, but I don't think he is going to want to debate, and I've never had uh, anybody, for the exception of one or two sort of Orthodox Jews, reach out to debate. Um, so we've had a couple of those debates in Discord, but typically those people don't want to debate, nor do they do that kind of debate uh, in terms of the philosophical level and depth with which we typically approach the topics. I'm not saying they're not intelligent people. I'm saying that when we get into the metaphysics of the Trinity, their philosophy and their worldview and their system is so different that it's typically talking past. So that's, in my view, typically why they don't want to do these kinds of debates because it usually ends up being they are obsessing on the Hebrew word in one text and that it only means that and you can't ever go beyond that. So the debates don't really go anywhere is what I'm trying to say. Hickory Dickory 86, $15. Would you consider a review of Better Capitalism by Paul Knowlton and Aaron Hedges? It looks interesting, but it's inherently flawed. It's written by a boomer and it's a revolutionary spirit evangelicalism. Honestly, no, <laughs> I don't have any interest in it. sounds really boring and not interesting at all. Uh, I don't, I mean, there could be some interesting insights in there. Um, it's just, uh, no, sorry, I'm not going to read that. And we've done many, many podcasts over the year. You could go back about four or five years ago to uh, where we did. We inter we did Quigley and we, we critique libertarianism, the boom bust cycle, the, the, not aggression principle. That's all stuff that I did countless podcasts on five or six years ago. Uh, so I'm not going to say anything different than I said back then, honestly. So, um, you know, when it comes to libertarians and von Mises, we can appreciate their insights. Uh, they, they have a lot of good ideas. They put out, I mean, Bitcoin comes out of that ethos. I'm, I'm a big fan of Bitcoin, but, um, when it comes to this kind of false, naive dialectic of it's the, heroic individual versus a collective state. I mean, that's just such a boomer, naive narrative. Reality is so much more complex than that. It's not the attitude of historic Orthodox Christianity that it's the individual fighting against the collective state. That's a false narrative that comes out of the Enlightenment. It's a Protestant narrative. It's just not true. And you can't wed that to Orthodox Christian theology, given that it's the exact opposite of the entire ethos of the first thousand years of Christianity. I mean, it's just, it, I'm sorry. I don't know what else to tell you, but um, I just, no, sorry. I'm not going to do that, but good question. Uh, anybody else in discord? Yeah. Um, so I have some questions about like more of a general thing uh, with like, yeah. like one at a time. You're, you're a robot and bro. You're a robot and bro. Go ahead. Was that me? No, the other guy. Go ahead. You go ahead. Okay. Um, so with like evolution, like what do you think the best way to refute evolution is? Because like, I feel like that narrative force with a lot of atheists is very strong. And um, yeah, like how would you refute that? I'm like more of like a like layman's terms, I guess. Well, the difficulty with quote layman's terms is that evolution, in my view, is a philosophy. And so it kind of requires some philosophical knowledge to do an adequate refutation of that view. So number one misunderstanding in my view is that evolution is not a uh, in strictly empirically based, uh, limited, uh, just going by the facts type of thing. I believe evolution is actually a, a super duper gigantic narrative philo philosophy which those people are duped into thinking is this empirically fact-based thing. And so they will just leap way off into crazy grand metaphysical narratives that are unjustified, which they then dial back and assume is just, just reporting the facts. So it's it has so many fundamentally mistaken epistemological assumptions and excessive reaches that the only way I can see to effectively argue against it is to argue against it philosophically. And the best essay to do that is the Titus Bruckhart essay in Sword of Gnosis. Sword of Gnosis is a book that's a collection of a bunch of perennialists. 
I'm not advocating everybody in that book. It's just that that's the book that happens to have Titus Brockhart's 60 page philosophical critique of evolution. And it's the best critique I've ever read. There's other good critiques. It's not the only good critique, but the best 50 to 60 page critique is Titus Brockhart's, I don't remember what it's called, but it's in that book. And it used to be $3 on Amazon. I don't know what it is now. But I still recommend that there's other good critiques, uh, Cosmos and Transcendence by Wolfgang Smith. and But the best is that one. And I don't know how you could refute that without getting into philosophy. But what happens is that people that do life sciences, they don't know anything about philosophy typically. So they think when they're doing empirical fact-based science, they're not doing philosophy. And they'll make all these wild metaphysical claims that they have no basis or justification for that they don't even realize are wild metaphysical philosophical claims they think they're just doing science so i don't know what so that's the best and if people read that essay and still believe evolutionary philosophy i I don't know what to say i mean to me it's ridiculous i don't know i mean i understand why people believe that a species adapts i don't have a problem with adaptation i think that's obvious but how we get to zillions of years and transmutation of species. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, I just feel like when I talk about atheists, I like, I feel like, like they're like on board with, with like what I'm saying. And then when we get to evolution, it kind of breaks down. So I guess that's something I have to read about. Cause uh, yeah, I read the Titus Bruckhart essay. It's great. It's 60 pages. I should do a, a live stream on that because a lot of people find it hard. I think it's hard to get. Sometimes that book's out of print, but Last time I checked, it wasn't out of print. Okay. okay uh, nice. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Today, the other day, um, we had uh, we had someone in here saying that um, none of the fathers taught anything related to biblical literalism at all, and it was tied to evolution, and they were trying to argue for evolution. Um, I just wanted to bring that up in case you had some things you wanted to say. We talked with them for a while, but um, I don't know. I just thought I'd bring it up. Well, I mean, the the first obvious uh, absurdity is that the most famous series of sermons on Genesis is St. Basil's Hexameron, which is all about the literal sense of Genesis. So, number one, from the outset, that's preposterous. Uh, Number two, the whole premise of Genesis creation early man is that the normative view of all the church fathers uh, is almost always that the literal sense of Genesis is true. There are some fathers who uh, overly allegorize it and uh, have differing views. For example, Augustine uh, has an, an odd view where he thinks it was all instantaneous. And people will try to appropriate that for evolution, which is absurd because he wrote another book called On Genesis in the Literal Sense, which affirms the historicity and literal sense of Genesis. So they're just being dishonest or lying when they try to appropriate Augustine for evolutionary theory, when his instantaneous view has nothing to do with evolutionary theory. And he wrote an entire commentary on the literal sense of Genesis. So uh, the other thing, too, is that it's pretty obvious when you, you could read Father Maximus Constant's introduction to At the Lassium, where in the whole essay introduction there for St. Maximus, he says that Maximus followed the normative view of his time, which had already parceled out the four-tiered sense of Scripture, the first sense of which is the literal. In other words, it's normative amongst all the church fathers to see the four senses grounded in the literal sense first and foremost. So that's just fundamentally totally wrong about patristic exegesis i've shared many times the quote from saint cyril of alexandria where he explicitly says when you deny the historical sense of the text in order to allegorize you are in the air you are in the wrong and you don't you can't do that he makes the very argument i always make which is that in galatians 4 when paul does his allegory the allegory presupposes that Hagar, Abraham, and Sarah were historical, real people. I mean, this this is so absurd, it shouldn't even be debated. It's not even a question. And most of the time, it comes from people who think they're really smart and sophisticated, who've not spent a lot of time reading the Church Fathers, and they think that typology is somehow a vindication of things not being historical or literal, which is dumb, dude. We've refuted this so many times. I did two live streams four years ago just on this topic 
critiquing Father Stephen Freeman. Not being mean. I don't hate Father Stephen Freeman. I'm not saying he's evil. I'm just saying that he has this view that's a popular, prevalent view, and it's false. It's wrong. And I did two live streams. They're still up just on that topic. So go watch those. I go into many, many, many works where we have an affirmation of the literal sense of the text. So again, people are confusing uh, fundamentalism with hermeneutics, two totally different issues. Hermeneutics is the science of interpreting the text. The dominant model coming out of the first six centuries, codified by the time of St. Maximus. That's not just me. You can go read Henry, uh, 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 you can go read uh, Medieval Exegesis by is it de Lubach. This is, this is well known even in the West, in Roman Catholic theologians. The four senses are grounded first on the literal. It shouldn't even, this shouldn't even, I mean, whoever's saying this doesn't know what they're talking about. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think a lot of it comes from people, um, people mistake quote unquote pro scientific progress with things that we should somehow go and ratify, <laughs> you know, beliefs that we've been taught through the church fathers into when that's the paradigm you view things through instead and they get things reversed. Well, I would just say go listen to uh, Seraphim Hamilton. Cobain uh, has uh, excellent arguments on all these same points. Uh, we, we are on the same page there. He agrees with me. Um, most of the church fathers, for example, believe in inerrancy and inspiration of Scripture. In fact, I've cited many, many texts over the years for this. Uh, I'm not talking about copy errors. Everybody recognizes that there are, are copy errors, but that's different than theological errors in the text. So I was looking for the Cyril quote because it always comes up. Um, it's in Genesis creation, early man. I can barely see the light in here. And it's just, it's just excellent because I didn't even know this was in here until I read the book. And then it's like the same argument that I've been making for years. And people argue with me. You don't know orthodoxy. Who are you just converted the other day? No, dude. I've been reading this stuff for 15 years. And literally, Cyril makes the very argument I've made all this time. And people calling me stupid and heretic and I'm an idiot. Mean. I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, he says exactly what I've said for years. Even before I was orthodox. So... <laughs> All the more am I vindicated by the fact that he says what Yeah, well, you are a diorite. Yeah, right. So, it's worth finding. Let me find it again. Here it is. So, here is, uh, this is page... In Genesis Creation, Early Man... Page 122 and 123. And it's not, it's not even controversial stuff. It's just a, a section where Father Rose cites various church fathers about the literal sense of the text. And that that is a hermeneutics issue, not an issue of fundamentalism. Okay, again, fundamentalism is the idea of the Protestants 100 years ago to come up with their version of the fundamentals of the faith, which are five things that they thought were necessary to be a Christian, namely the virgin birth, the resurrection, the Trinity, deed of Christ, inspiration of scripture. Okay. And maybe a couple more. Well, uh, everybody who believes in basic orthodoxy is by that argument, a fundamentalist, but that is different from an, another type of, question which is about textual criticism and inspiration which is called fundamentalism which is conflated with quote literalism and over literalizing that's a hermeneutical mistake that for example premillennialists make or seven day adventists make when they read the apocalypse and they think there's going to literally going to be a dragon flying around i'm not joking okay that's a fundamentalist quote unquote hermeneutical mistake that has nothing to do with the doctrine of inspiration of scriptures because all parties who believe in the inspiration of scripture can have differing hermeneutics right so two different issues that constantly get conflated they don't know what they're talking about even father freeman doesn't know what he's talking about on this topic i'm not saying he's a bad person i don't know him yeah why, why, why come you expert if you've never even been to science school <laughs> yeah right 
Uh, I've, I've been drinking science juice for the last year and I'm sci- I've been drinking the chalk.com science supplements and they've made me competent in science. So here's what St. Cyril says that just basically makes this point. Cyril of Alexandria wrote that you cannot uh, apprehend correctly the scriptures if one attempts to contemplate their spiritual meaning without respect to the historical meaning. Quote, those who reject the historical meaning of the God-inspired te- scriptures as something obsolete, avoiding the ability to apprehend rightly according to the proper manner the things written in them. For indeed, spiritual contemplation is good and profitable, and it is enlightening the eye of reason especially well. It reveals the wisest things. But who, whenever some historical event is presented to us in Scripture, then in that instance, a useful search into the historical meaning is appropriate in order that the God-inspired Scripture be revealed as salvific and beneficial to us in every way. Right underneath that's another quote from St. Nihilus of Sinai about the necessity of the historicity of the text. St. John Chrysostom is quoted on the uh, previous page, 122, about the historicity of the text. And so this is not even an issue. Again, even liberal scholars admit this and know this. Uh, I've read De Lubach's Medieval Exegesis. I read it when I was a Roman Catholic because this same problem would come up in debates in the Roman Catholic sphere as well, right? Because they have textual liberals who think that they're smarter than everybody else and how they know that the the texts are all allegorical and they're not historical and we don't have to believe in these myths of genesis because that's all invented babylonian mythology that's what even uh, father romanides romanides says genesis is uh pagan babylonian creation myths no it's not and again this whole book is dedicated to demonstrating that that is not the historic belief of the church now you might believe that in the modern times you might but i can trump all of that with the confession of saint sophronius at the sixth council which dogmatizes that you can't accept any of origin's positions on genesis the fall or the garden of eden it's four pages from saint sophronius accepted at the council that explicitly condemns allegorizing genesis so anybody who says and wants to dispense with genesis in the literal sense is under the condemnation of St. Sophronius at the Sixth Council. And I I have posted that ad nauseum probably 50 times in the last four years. Kane London, $10. Do you think that groups like, uh, I'm not going to say, this is a hot topic issue. Um, uh, So I'm sorry, I just... We, we have strictures on what kinds of topics we can talk about. And uh, Kane, if you want your $10 super chat back, I'm happy to give it to you. But of course, we can't talk about that, as you know, on YouTube. So uh, anybody in Discord wants to talk about anything else? Uh, hi, it's me again, Zach. Hey, what's up? Uh, I was, well, as soon as I went, as soon as I left talking about the Pepsi there, I went down to show my dad, who doesn't like you, he thinks you're a bad guy. Um, I... I showed him where I, where I was talking on the live stream, and eventually I came into a discussion about Chris, about you know uh, justification and Protestantism versus Orthodoxy, and we had a small debate on imputation. What what's your take on imputation righteousness? Um, so we we've, we've deconstructed this many many times. Um, I would say I'm going to refer you to the videos that we did um on saint john damascus where i go into the meaning of christ's death i think it's in the third one so i lecture through the totality of on the orthodox faith um seraphim hamilton has a great uh couple videos and multiple videos on why imputation theory doesn't work so i'm not trying to i'm not trying to dismiss you it's just that we we have done probably 20 talks and videos and articles that cover this so i'll be happy to send you those but uh, I mean, in, in short, the, the easy answer is that uh, imputation theory makes God a liar because God calls um, people and things that are not righteous, righteous, which is a lie. Uh, it does not. <coughs> it's a Nestorian view of Christ <coughs> because it's typically it, it's a uh, Jesus <coughs> who was cut off from the father. And that's either anti-Trinitarian or it's uh, yeah. Nestorian or Arian. Um, and so um, that alone should be enough. Yeah, w- w- R.C. Sproul has something on this. He he says that um, the reason God, J- Jesus, didn't need to go to hell for imputed righteousness is to work because he says that the Son of God suffering on the cross for five minutes is enough to to 
Yeah. It doesn't matter because it's it's it doesn't matter if he's literally going into torments because many reformers said Luther said that he received the equivalent of damnation in five minutes on the cross. It doesn't matter because the point is not that the point is that for him to be damned means that he's not a divine person. He's not the second person of the Godhead. How do you split the Trinity by having one person of the Trinity cut off from God? That's dividing the Trinity. It's blasphemous. Yeah. I'm not mad at you. I'm just saying that doctrine is just crazy. Oh, no, yeah. But they don't even uh, know, they don't even realize that it's anti-Trinitarian. Yeah. They think of Jesus as a, a man in, a, in an historian yeah. way. And, and Calvinists are basically an historian, no, no matter how yeah. anti-historian they claim to be. Herman, Herman Ruderboss, uh, you pointed that out on your video with, um, what's his name? Oh, it's uh, in the essay. So I wrote, I wrote an essay uh, on the Logos being not a Greek idea, but actually from the wisdom text. And yeah. I cite Herman Ritterboss in his commentary on John, where he explicitly talks about Jesus in a Nestorian way. Yeah, I was laughing at that. I thought that was hilarious. Jesus is not a uh, human person. Uh, yeah. He <laughs> is the second person of the Godhead. The only he is the Logos. That's it. There's no other he. Yeah. He's a divine person who assumed a human nature, not a human person. Yeah. So I, I made an argument back to my dad saying that if you want to believe in imputed righteousness, you also have to believe that the lambs who were killed in the Old Testament period are is imputing its own righteousness to Israel, and he didn't have a reply. Well, the, the classical reformer, will Re reformation person, will say that those were just types of the work of Christ. So he could just, he would probably just say, or a reformed theologian would say, no, you know, Scripture says, uh, you know, Hebrews says the, the blood of goats and bulls cannot take away sin. It cannot impute righteousness to you. But because Christ is God-man, they'll say it can. Yeah. But they think of it as, uh, another way to refute this is that they think of it as a like Christ merited this. So he perfectly kept the Mosaic law, which merited the perfect righteousness that he, he then imputes to all of the people that believe in him. But that's actually also uh, an Arian idea because it makes the uh, grace and righteousness of Christ uh, a created reality. And yeah. Christ if, is not... If Mary was sinless, you could have the same thing with Mary. Well, we believe Mary is sinless, so... Yeah, 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 I know, but it could be the same thing if Mary was on the cross, if that was true. Yeah, but they'll just say, "Well, we don't believe Mary." They, they'll believe Mary. They believe Mary is sinful, so they'll just get yeah, around. Yeah. They'll re, they'll point out that Christ merited this by keeping the covenant of works. But they that's a, that whole model is as if Jesus is a human person meriting this. Yeah. No, Christ is a divine person who, from the moment of his incarnation, uh, immediately confers to his human body the full, uncreated divine energies that he possesses. Yeah, good, good stuff. Yeah. So, in other words, uh, Calvinism is another version of created grace. Created righteousness that Christ merits is another form of created grace, and so it's susceptible yeah. to all the same critiques that we would give of the Roman Catholics. Yeah, the Protestants really could have done something a lot better if they had went to the Eastern Fathers and criticized the Catholic Church from there. Well, Luther uh, appropriated some Eastern critiques, and he wrote a few. Yeah. There was a few letters back and forth, but um, it didn't really go anywhere. But yeah, you're right. Frankie D, five dollars. Uh, God bless you, Jay. Do you think that there is evidence that some of the plans of the global elite are failing? Um, I think that part of the reason why they rolled this out in the last two years is not because they were failing, but that the they were kind of behind schedule. And I mean, there's talks where Brzezinski was talking in that way before he passed away. They were like, you know, just saying that things weren't uh, behind, were behind schedule and there's the possibility of mass awakening. There's a famous lecture, you know, where, where Brzezinski said that like five, six years ago. So uh, I wouldn't say failing, but maybe uh, behind schedule. So that might explain why things rolled out so quick in the last two years. Um, you say, I've also seen some computer models of, quote, evolution, which lead to zero genetic diversity. Uh, could be, I, I don't really, I mean, you can make computer models say anything. I mean, Gil Bates uses computer models to prove literally everything. So 
Uh, I mean, I'm not saying computer models don't work, but I mean, it's just a model. So a lot of people confuse computer models with like, <laughs> it's the science proves it. And we've seen that. You can, uh, you can use a computer model to show that Superman can fly around the world in like five seconds. Yeah, exactly. If you just base it off of like certain math. If you put enough of the, if you put enough of the science in it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, anybody else in discord before we close it up tonight? I wanted to actually just make a kind of like an additive point about evolution just in that like I think a lot of people who aren't very inquisitive and just kind of like accept it on face value because it's very much taught like dogmatically as like just the most obvious dominant theory in school Mm -hmm. that it really is just a particular interpretation of empirical data that like they literally just can't prove it all i mean well yeah the, the whole like, the whole model like most of the scientism crowd is operating on the assumption that facts are neutral and they mean what they say and they say what they mean they just present themselves to our senses and it's obvious when we look at the rocks that they're millions of years old and it's obvious that uh, nature operated in a uniform way at all times and it's, it, it's operating all these presuppositions that are unquestioned because again they don't do philosophy they think they're doing empirical fact-based science and they're all still under the delusions of enlightenment philosophy from 500 years ago they think they're doing that they don't realize that's been totally de- decimated and critiqued philosophically and part of that is because people don't learn philosophy modern education is compartmentalized and they don't know they're doing philosophy and metaphysics while they sit around and laugh and say that philosophy and metaphysics is stupid. We, we don't do that anymore. And they're sitting there making all these metaphysical claims. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. Like it, it really is as simple as, um, like interpreting and noticing is similarities between like anatomies of organisms and I know, yeah, that's what that's what Ernst backwards right, to Ernst Haeckel, right, and everybody should ancestor, yeah, and everybody should look at Ernst Haeckel and his whole fraud that was built on doing that very thing, and the fact that ontogeny fell apart, and this should just it should be laughed at. But this is a, a philosophy that is amenable to the very power structure that has been in control of a large portion of the world since Darwinism appeared, and as you've heard me say for at least ten years. Darwinism is a philosophy that was part and parcel with the mythology of the Anglo-American Empire, the British Empire. It's the philosophy of the British Empire. Yeah, I actually made, I kind of did like a little trolley own with someone in a debate where I brought up um, how Darwin's Origin of Species book was originally talking about how like the anglosphere of man was like peak humanity yeah. basically and that, no, i mean it's the title of the that, book like, the title that, of the book like, is that are so obsessed with like the like the leftist type sjw stuff and then they like adhere to stuff created by people like that no that's because the people who say these things don't know anything about geopolitics and they act like uh the domain of academia has nothing to do with power blocks and and funding and geopolitics it's just fundamentally ignorant they don't realize that uh worldviews are like uh propaganda systems and they're a technology and they're used to control people and that's been the case for a long time and darwinism is one of the great examples of that as the mythos of the british empire they basically said uh the i mean it's called the evolution of species of the favored races of man and yeah. the whole implication is that black people are not evolved. And, I mean, and, the, the, and now, nowadays, from, it's supposedly... From the perspective of like evolution, I mean, you could actually make an argument in that way. Like, like, like that's the kind of, the whole weird point That's what they, they should say if they were like consistent, that. right? But they're not consistent. And I've actually, yeah. I've actually read the Malthusians... And the Royal Society people of the last 200 years. I've read Galton. I've read these people. I've read the Huxleys, TH, and the, the crazy Huxley sons. 
So I actually know their position. I know what eugenics is. I, I've read the, the source documents of the people that cooked it up and fostered, fostered and funded those societies. And so it's totally stupid of these people to think that they can divorce it from that and have this scientific approach that is not connected to the eugenics, the just dysgenics and the racial science approach. That's the whole ethos of it. You can't separate the two. But they, that people think that they're, it's all about like caving to academia and making things amenable to, well, we have to look good to people in academia. No, you don't. Academia is a bunch of goobers, Marxists, uh, PEDOs. That's who's in academia, just like in mainstream media and Hollywood. It's the same degenerate, scummy people that run those things. So no, you don't have to make things amenable to these demonic people. But it's all rooted in, uh, watering it down to be acceptable to the academic class who are a bunch of demons. Yeah, I don't want to harp on, because like evolution can kind of be beat, beaten to death because I think it's just that silly. But I, I I think like I made this point to someone that like um, noticing some degree of similarity among being or like beings or animals, well, we would call them creatures, obviously like just noticing some degree of similarity doesn't actually contradict christianity in that god can create yep like the material part of beings with the same kind of building blocks you yeah know, i mean like, i was just thinking about how like, silly like, uh, yeah. like carbon-based light like we're all carbon-based life forms from a scientific perspective but that doesn't actually contradict christian creationism yeah, the same, the same, that's called the underdetermination of data. The fact that two different, yeah. two different systems can interpret data adequately does not tell you which of those two systems is correct. That's why evidentialism doesn't work, by the way. Yeah, I think some people are actually just kind of like, like when I told that to someone, they seem kind of like mind blown when they thought about it for a moment that I just made like that simple point that, you know, like God can God can create the material body of a person that you know with carbon and do that with like a cow. That doesn't make us therefore we have an ancestral connection. Well, or think about an easier example. Um, I mean, don't we often see people that look like other people? Like, whoa, that guy looks just like Nick Cage, right? Well, yeah. how stupid it would have yeah. been. Oh, look, like, dude, uh, Nick Cage or, and, and that guy have the same dad because they look the same. You see how stupid that is? It's just a, or, like, or, or like a quarter has like a face on it, yeah. like George Washington. Therefore, it's... Therefore, George Washington meant it all the... He meant it all the quarters, yeah. Abraham yeah. Lincoln is on the penny, so he meant it all the pennies, yeah. Uh, Orthodox Logos, $1. Is there no guru whistle? There you go. There's the booger whistle from Osho for you. Fish Monkey, $5. Opinions about the theory that Israel caused Bronze Age collapse? Uh, never heard of that. Don't know anything about it. Kane London, $1. No big deal. I sent an email. Great show. Nikki Stees, you're on a roll tonight. Keep up. Great work. Well, thank you, Nikki Stees. A long time super chatter and supporter there, Nikki Stees. Glad to see you still uh, steezing around these skeezy parts with the Chad nerds. Anybody else in Discord? I'm getting a little a little tired, so I may have to call it a night. But I want to remind you guys before we uh, take the last little bit of questioning here, there is uh, quite a few excellent new things posted. So Ubi has done a great refutation of a, a particularly annoying, petulant character, Yasi. So if you want to go see the refutation of Yasi and his supposed defense of Ibarra, uh, definitely check out Ubi's takedown. It's pretty monumental. I saw most of it uh, the other day. And let's see what else we've got. This monumental takedown of Anthony Rogers. Now, I uh, I didn't have time to um, debate Anthony Rogers. Not that it wasn't even necessarily set up, but uh, Lewis and some people wanted to get that going. Um, I've got too many things going right now. And done a lot of debates i'm kind of taking a break uh so perry has uh done a excellent multi-hour refutation of anthony rogers 
that is right here. So everybody go check that out over on Sam Samoon's, Shamoon's channel. So uh, really glad that he took the time and effort to go through and refute that in detail where he shows that no, just because people are using the word faith alone or just because this phrase is used, it does not equate to the Protestant doctrine of sola fide. So it's a great lengthy uh, takedown of that. I got into the first hour this morning. I didn't, I had to take a break, do some other things. But uh, so far I'm an hour in, I can tell it's already uh, gold status. Uh, also, uh, there is a, speaking of St. Maximus, <clears throat> now it's Father Maximus Constance that did the introductory uh, section to Ad Thalassium. And there's a, that's a great essay actually as an introduction to St. Maximus's hermeneutic. And in that essay, St. Father Maximus mentions the fact that St. Maximus held to the four-tiered sense of scripture, the first of which is vindicating and affirming the literal sense. So there is an interview there between Jonathan Pajot, I recommend, with uh, Father Maximus on the theology of St. Maximus. Separate from all of that, I did a video this weekend at this goofy exhibit in the mall of the Sistine Chapel, which actually ended up being more, I actually brought my fancy camera and I didn't take it into the mall because I thought this one wouldn't be that interesting. And it was actually more interesting than I thought because it's all about the, what's the meaning and the symbols of the panels. So I had to do it on my iPhone. So it's kind of crappy, but the video makes the, the point that Snack and I have made in many videos about the oddities bizarreties, weirdities in Michelangelo's Renaissance art and in the Renaissance ethos as a whole. Uh, so definitely go and check out the Michelangelo Sistine Chapel video that I did this weekend. It's not long. It's about eight minutes. And let's see. We also have in how many days is this one? In a few days, 18th. So five days. If you guys remember, I did the debate with uh, Azrar, Sheikh Azrar Rashid. Uh, Father Deacon will be having a discussion with Azrar on epistemology. And of course, as you know, in the debate, that was a, a, a key topic that kept coming up that we kept kind of going around and round on. And so uh, they will be discussing orthodox anthropology and then uh, the sort of empiricist approach that uh, Azrar Rashid has that is exactly the same as the Thomist. So, so uh, there was some, there's a lot of really interesting elements there. Uh, also, uh, be sure and look over at Patristic Faith. So uh, Father Deacon has gotten that up and rolling. We've got multiple new people that have stepped uh, on to also being involved, uh, including Father John Whiteford, Father George Aquaro, uh, uh, Proto Deacon Patrick has his book linked there. Uh, David, the real Med White is uh, there. Whitcoff is there. Uh, Father Deacon is there. I think I miss am I, the Kotel is over there. So everybody be sure and check out Patristic Faith and sign up to get the updates and the email links there. And is there anything else in the Discord? By the way, I think a lot of people are saying notifications are not working anymore on YouTube videos. I've noticed a, a, a decline in live video viewership in the last two weeks. Now, YouTube has changed the algorithm once again, which they change often. And I noticed that if you're on, for example, the app, you can no longer look up the recent videos under somebody's name. Because a lot of people would, for example, they look at my name on YouTube and then they would look at the most recent video. And so a lot of video, and it's not just me, this is a lot of people. So uh, videos are seeming to get fewer views uh, across the board for everybody, I think because of whatever different changes they've done. And people are saying that there's that notifications don't work. So you have to turn on notifications again on the channel to get the channel updates. If it, and it doesn't happen to everybody. I don't know why it does this. I don't know what they're doing, but so click on notifications. Uh, anything else in the discord questions? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I don't have a question, but I just want to say like a big thank you because Whenever I was a Protestant, I would always, I, I didn't understand Christianity that much, and I sometimes thought this is inconsistent with that. I want to thank you so much for explaining orthodoxy to me because 
I live in Northern Ireland. There isn't a lot of Orthodox here. So right. I'm very kind of isolated right now. Mm-hmm. But I'm just, thank you so much for introducing Orthodoxy because Orthodoxy is, I, I'm so committed to it. Oh, well, that's good and, to hear. Yeah, I know that, that yeah. Ireland is a rough area for that. I know Father Deacon was there for a while, but really? yeah, I mean, I, I'm just, and, and I have to thank the people, uh, you know, that helped me along the way. There's a lot of people involved in that process. Uh, actually, Space Jockey Perry was one of those people through his old blog. Uh, many other people along the way. Father Deacon helped me along the way. Uh, Father Vladimir, you know, the people that received Father Snowden, the different people that, you know, were involved in receiving me over the years and helping me. So, uh, it, yeah. you know, thank you for the thanks, but yeah, thank you know, it's, it's a, it's everybody in this communal, yeah. communal effort. So. Yeah. I, I'd be up at, at night and I'd be getting carried away. Like I've been listening to dire streams for like the past few months. I just don't go to sleep. I, I'm just so immersed in everything. I'm really, really just thank you so much for everything you've been teaching. Everyone. Well, yeah, but, uh, and, and, but take me in doses. Don't, don't get too, yes, don't, yes. <laughs> don't sacrifice your livelihood for no, listening to, to me, but thank you for that. I appreciate it. I appreciate being able to talk to you. I'm a big fan. Big, big fan. Okay. Thank you, man. All right. See ya. Yes, sir. Hey, I just got a quick question. It's mm. about um, it's about prayer. So um, I've been watching a lot of videos recently about prayer in the Orthodox Church, mm-hmm. and I know that some people are saying that you shouldn't like go straight into like silent prayer or things like that, but I'm wondering, and it's just genu- genuinely curious, how, like, how do you, how would you say you would start getting into the practice or habit of prayer? Or what is a good way to go about praying? Like, do you say it out loud? Do you say it in, because I really don't know, to be honest. So I was wondering what, what your take on that would be, what, what the, like with the Jesus prayer and stuff like that. Right. So typically we get a lot of these kinds of questions. And uh, it's ironic because a lot of the criticism of what we do and what we talk about, people say that this is a cult and, but uh, I don't I don't comment on what people should do spiritually, uh, and that's because that's not my role. I always tell people that you need to take those questions to people who are in the church who do have that job and that function. So uh, I'll tell you that I pray the the little blue Orthodox uh, prayer book from the monastery. It's a little it's the little Greek one, or maybe it's I don't remember where it's from. It's either Jordan Jordanville or the Greek monastery, that, but it's a little blue prayer book that's been around for ten years. Um, and we do those kind of daily prayers or I, we do the Psalms. Actually, we kind of follow the pattern of what a lot of monastics and bishops do, which is to pray through the Psalms consistently. But, uh, but I, I'm not, it's not my position to tell you how to pray and what to pray. That's what you will take uh, to your spiritual father. And so you, you'll, when you're in the Orthodox church, you'll find a spiritual father, um, and he will give you a prayer rule and he will counsel you and that kind of stuff. And that's precisely why we don't jump into mystical prayer and that kind of stuff in the orthodox sense hesychia without a spiritual father uh but that is not my role as a layman and as a guy on the internet and so i can't tell you what to do but when you find a good orthodox church they will tell you what to do and how to go about that all right thank you sure anybody else i had one for you jay okay um I totally, of course, agree with what you were saying before about, you know, warrior saints, but um, when it comes to, like, offensive warfare, you could say, like, would we say that that's, like, there's only, like, the only time I can think of where, uh, where like, you know, warrior, emperor, saint did something, like, was more of, like, offensively conquering would be Justinian, sort of taking back the areas of the Western Roman Empire, which had been taken over by, like, you know, the Visigoths who were uh, Arians. Would we say that something like that is like the only situation where like offensive warfare specifically would be justified as opposed to like defending your country from invaders? I don't know. Uh, it's a really good question. I don't know. <laughs> Some, sometimes, I mean, sometimes there's questions. I don't know. I mean, I know you think I might know, but I don't know. Um, I thought you knew everything. No, I don't. And, and I don't. Uh, I'm have a, in my diorite <laughs> yeah right turn now. in your diorite cult card i don't know that's actually a great question um probably in the history of like you know orthodox nations that type of question has come up uh but i don't know enough to say 
I, I know that obviously, like, you know, in the history of, like, the Russian Empire, there was a lot of, you know, territorial expansion. Yeah. But, of course, a lot of the Russian emperors and the Byzantine emperors, you know, weren't, weren't saints. They might have been doing it, you know, for corrupt reasons. That is a good question, and I honestly don't yeah. know. And then it's just super random, super random. Um, no, I'll tell you, you that probably, so like, a, a very, like, a, a super knowledgeable, erudite history buff guy would probably know that kind of question. Mm. Um, super random, totally different. Have you ever done anything looking into like method acting and how like method acting totally seems to come out of like cult, you know? No, it does. I, I, I know. Practices. I have. Uh, I've read Stanislavski's text. Yes, I know about it. Yeah. And yes, he I was just, in. He was in mind because someone sent me like a profile of one of the like big like uh, the actor um, Jeremy Strong from the TV show Succession, who's like seems to have just totally programmed himself into being a complete psycho. <laughs> yes. So if you read Stanislavski's works, this is what he says to do. Uh, now, when I read it, I didn't, it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like, go to the, you know, uh, occult ritual. And like it wasn't like that. It wasn't like him telling you like which secret society to join, to get possessed. But it's like, um, he, it's like telling you these techniques of like, uh, relax and like let your conscious persona like drift into the background and, tr and try to bring up these other personas so if you read his actual writings that's the kind of stuff that he says and then if I recall he himself was involved in occult secret societies so th there's something there going on and it is it does have that es esoteric occult flavor to it and he does say to do that kind of stuff, like become the psycho and, you know, but, um, yeah. yeah, that's what I recall. But that was like 10 years ago when I read his thing on method acting. Cause I know that, and I know that like Lee Strasberg, who was also big in, uh, that like he had the Strasberg acting school. He was, I think, uh, either a Scientologist or connected with the church of Scientology. And he's considered like one of the other like fathers of method acting. Yeah. And all of the, the A-list people typically are into that, you know, like, Christian Bale and Robert De Niro yeah. and they're, they're all, they all try the to do Americans. that. Like I, in the article, it was actually interesting. It was quoting, um, was like there's the famous, um, story of Dustin Hoffman and Laurence Olivier doing the movie Marathon Man. And, you know, Olivier is like more trained in like the classical British theater style. And, you know, like to rehearse for the torture scene, Dustin Hoffman had stayed up for three days straight without sleeping. And Olivier was like, why don't you try acting? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, that's all I know on that. By the way, uh, Sweet. go ahead. Thanks. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, also, the uh, Sam Hyde channel put up the new pill put up a uh, one a new video with a bunch of Sam clips with me and Sam. So you can check that one out too. That one oh, popped nice. up today. So I put that in the live stream chat. And so if you're watching this later. Uh, on YouTube, these are in the live stream chat. So everybody, you can if you're looking for the things I'm referencing as I'm saying them, they're in the live stream chat. All right.